Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the Health RI Conference 2021. And uh, I hope you're doing fine. You're healthy, safe behind the laptop or whatever screen you're watching right now. I'm here in a studio together with some people here that I will introduce in a minute. Um, but I'm very happy to be here, your host today. My name is Egge van der Poel and this is the Health RI Conference. And we're going to talk about how Health RI is moving forward. Um, and we have an, a very nice uh, schedule uh, uh, today. Um, um, we had some technical difficulties just before we started, so sorry for the introduction uh, at this point, but we have a chat function in the network app where you can ask questions to us, and I'm sure we will find one way or another to get the questions to us. <laughs> so that's our technical problem, don't worry about that. I hope you've been strolling around in a network app, um, and if you, be, you may, may have said hello to some of your acquaintances already there. Uh, if not, feel free to browse around there uh, after the plenary talks, because today we will have a first a plenary session, and then you can join some parallel sessions in the network app. Um, these are special times, as I'm sure everybody has, uh, is, is well aware of. So instead of seeing each other in a big conference room, we're now seeing each other through cameras and through screens. Um, but I think due to these special times, uh, things like Health RI are of much more importance, or at least people are much more aware of the importance of Health RI uh, and initiatives like Health RI. Because we've seen now in this COVID pandemic that access to information, access to data is of paramount importance. And this is something that Health RI has been working on for many, many years already. Uh, and for now, um, uh, we would like to start the program with uh, uh, well, the board of Health RI and to go through the why, the how and the what of Health RI. Um, be before going into that, I'm, I'm seeing also the screen where you, what you are seeing. I would also like to just browse through the program of the rest of uh, the afternoon um, because we will first have the plenary talk with the chiefs here. Then we ha will have uh, an introduction from the Health RI communities where you can see where the Health RI expertise is gathering and where uh, they're actually doing the work, so to say. Uh, but then we'll have a very interesting international uh, re reflection from Professor Arno Palotti, um, followed by some national showcases where these are initiatives that are connecting to Health RI as an organization. Um, that's the plenary part that will finish around 15.30, so 3.30 p.m. Um, and afterwards, you can go to meetups and parallel sessions all through the network app. And remember to go there because this, that's the place where you can see all the, uh, the nice demonstrations, the sessions, but also you can meet the sponsors and so on and so forth. So do visit there, <coughs> visit the network app, and this will be available for the next month. So, as I said uh, before we started here, and you did not see it, it's, it's okay if things go wrong. So, uh, we started already without the, 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 the iPad in front of me, so we've managed to do something wrong already. Uh, and hopefully we'll do uh, many things wrong, but we'll learn from it. Um, for now, let's move on. Um, the chat function I mentioned, the social media hashtag, you, I'm sure you're well aware of Health Right 2021. And now uh, on to the, the actual content, what we're here for. Um, I would like to introduce four chiefs. I have the honor and privilege to sit on a table with four chiefs. We have Gerrit Meijer, first to my left, the chief scientific officer of Health RI. Then we have Leone Flikweert. She's the chief executive officer of Health RI. Then we have Viro Niese, the chief technical officer of Health RI. And we have Ruben Kok, the chief strategic alliances of Health RI. And as we already said before, uh, starting the session, with all these chiefs, where are the Indians? But let's see where, where, <laughs> well, what our reflections will be afterwards. Starting with the why, the how, and the what of Health RI, I think it's impressive that Health RI has been well working for so many years um, uh, not about thinking about changing things, thinking how to be able to change things. And in the past few months and years, it's actually been also transformating towards doing things. And um, well, let's see if Gerrit, as a first uh, presenter, can help us to introduce a bit the why of Health RI. Um, and then afterwards, Leone, Viro and Ruben will also come uh, into uh, play. And this will be, uh, well, a little bit introduced also with some slides. Um, and these slides will become available after the session. You can find the slides afterwards in the network app. Um, and for now, let's just have a conversation. So, Gerrit, please take us away into the why of Health RI. Thank you, Erge. So, um, let's move on with the slides. So why Health RI? Uh, that's always a good question. What problem are we actually solving? Uh, so Health RI is a national health data infrastructure for research and innovation. 
And uh, first of all, perhaps good to mention that when we say data, we have a very broad definition of data. So for us, that's not only figures and characters, that also includes all types of images, but also um, uh, biosamples, which basically uh, for research are containers of data. And, um, and having said that, um, yeah, it's, it's good to keep in mind that, that um, um, setting up an infrastructure to use all of that um, is not a goal in itself, but it's a means to an end. And, and the goal actually that we are after is um, to perform excellent science that is going to translate in better health outcomes for citizens. And uh, that may sound trivial, we all are kind of doing that, um, but when you um, uh, think a little bit further than, than uh, what's happening uh, in everyday routine, then um, it's also obvious that um, turning um, new knowledge of biology into, um, into applications that are going to ben benefit uh, citizens and patients uh, really can be challenging. And, and actually the challenge has a name, that's the innovation gap. And uh, so we know, of course, of examples where that um, runs perfectly smooth. Um, many great new drugs that, that have a specific molecular target, uh, a, bi a biological mechanism that, that has been solved and that can help uh, addressing that specific um, disease. But still, there are many diseases out there for which we do not yet have these drugs. And even beyond um, uh, drugs, challenges are even bigger when it comes to uh, med tech or when it comes to diagnostics. Um, business models are quite different. And actually, there, um, bridging this gap from proof of concept to ultimately uh, the patient really is a big challenge. And that's uh, a main problem that HealthRI aims to, uh, aims to, 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 to solve. And um, so um, what it is very much about is during that whole process of performing health research, personalized medicine research, actually facilitate that whole process from uh, the start, from the research question, down to actually when the research has been completed and data have, have been generated to um, make those data also uh, reusable. And, and if you um, try to capture the challenges that we have in a single word, then that word, uh, word would be uh, fragmentation. So we have fragmentation in almost all aspects that we are dealing with, whether it is uh, the way we deal with uh, data, but also uh, the organizations which we have, in which we do that uh, and the resources that we have available. So HealthRI is very much about connecting all links of the health uh, research process chain and, and actually also trying to speed it up. Uh, so we all uh, probably are familiar with the evidence-based medicine uh, concept that we are uh, using in our healthcare system. And, ever, uh, and actually this, um, uh, the time period from gener starting to generate data to actually um, implementing uh, innovations in care really can take a long time. And, and what we basically um, envision is that we can move to a situation where that can be done much more real time because all of these data um, are there uh, suitable to be used. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question. I, I yeah. want you to add that I would interrupt, right? So, I mean, uh, yeah, what, what took you so long? I, I, sorry, I, I gave you one extra minute. No, um, <laughs> I'm curious. There's this innovation gap, right? And yeah. uh, listening to you, I, I get the feeling this is a two-way street now if you, because it's not only going from research to care, but also from care to research. Is it true to say maybe that in the past, the questions formulated that initiated HealthRI were more from a, from a research perspective and that were questions about a data infrastructure. And now you see more and more that from the care perspective, there's also more questions about we don't need data, we need relevant information, so to say. Is that something that HealthRI has been set up also uh, to accommodate that? Yeah, I, th I think that's spot on. And actually, uh, that's a very nice introduction to my last bullet on this slide. <laughs> very well. <laughs> uh, because, uh, yeah, so, so traditionally, and uh, there has also been a gap, not the innovation gap, but perhaps a culture gap between um, people working in research infrastructure, biobanking data, research IT, and, and people um, 
uh, on, on more the care side, the, the clinical research. And actually that interaction also is very critical to make sure that um, uh, at the infrastructure side we will be guided by the challenges that are, um, are being uh, observed on, on the clinical side. And yeah. so actually bringing um, those community together, and communities together of on one hand the infrastructure exp experts and on the other hand the actual users um, of, of the data and, and the samples and, and what have you. And that is a, uh, a challenge that, that uh, we are working on and actually, um, well, when you look at where we are now uh, um, with this meeting with over uh, 600 participants with a very broad range of, of expertise, I think, uh, we're, we're starting to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy to see you, uh, at least. Yeah. Figure of speech. Okay, let's move on to uh, my next slide, uh, because um, now we have discussed the why. Um, the next uh, question, of course, is, is how are we going to do that? And um, I think um, we have a quite clear and, and, um, uh, and effective and also practical approach um, to uh, explain how we want to move forward here and how we want to uh, address this challenge of the innovation gap and, and the fragmentation that is behind all of that. Uh, so uh, we have three action lines which are uh, shown here in these uh, three uh, blue columns. And the first action line is actually about aligning people, bringing people and initiatives uh, around the table, building a national trust framework, as we call it, uh, where all kinds of different dimensions are being addressed, involving the citizens, uh, both uh, at a representation level and at an individual level. Um, um, yeah, stimulating the adoption of, of uh, standards, um, uh, standardizing the way we deal with data, data governance, uh, but also addressing issues on, on public-private collaborations, because uh, if we want to uh, bring these, uh, these solutions to patients and citizens in the end, that uh, also is going to require the participation of, of uh, of non-academic uh, parties, uh, companies. So uh, if you like, actually this whole column one is about making uh, people, communities and initiatives fair. Uh, well, that's uh, also a nice step up to the second column, <laughs> which is about uh, making the data fair uh, and everything that is uh, needed for that. And, and uh, I'm not gonna elaborate too much on that. Uh, uh, Vero will get back to, de to that part. Uh, so this is uh, very much everything that is uh, under the hood uh, and that may be uh, very attractive for people who are uh, uh, yeah, working in this field from a technical perspective, but uh, for others it may um, uh, really be something they li would like to keep under the hood. They just want uh, the system to work, a uh, turnkey solution, just like people drive their cars. Uh, and the, the third part is actually, yeah, that, that dashboard actually of the car, if you like, having a one-stop shop where um, you can have access to the data, uh, where um, there is a tooling available, um, either open source or perhaps also from, uh, from uh, proprietary solutions from companies, but also um, support. And I think one of the examples here is the, uh, the LC service desk. Of course, then uh, there needs a foundation to uh, organize that and manage that. And uh, Leona will get back to that. And just looking a little bit uh, back on, on how we are doing here. Uh, so we have been working uh, on the concept of Health for I, I think now for about five years. Um, and initially uh, very much um, yeah, getting people uh, enthusiastic about the idea. And, and for instance, the Netherlands Federation of University Medical Centers, uh, uh, Zon and Wey, Health Holland, but also others have been um, uh, yeah, very supportive in, in bringing Health or I where we are at now. Um, the, the financing that we now have for three years from the NFU has been very instrumental in that. But uh, uh, from here, actually, we are looking forward for uh, the next years to, to make uh, the big step forward. And, and uh, as probably many of you are aware, we have submitted this um, proposal for uh, the, the Groeifonds um, um, funding, and, and we're um, yeah, eagerly awaiting the, um, uh, the outcome of that, which should be in, uh, within two months, we, we hope, and we hope for the best, of course. So um, then I move to um, 
to this slide, uh, uh, talking about fragmentation. I think that's the main theme that one can uh, read from this slide. Uh, so let me try to guide you through, through that. Um, so this is how we kind of uh, position HealthRI in, uh, in a broader ecosystem. So um, uh, this, this blue square um, is the, uh, the health research uh, domain. Uh, and uh, of course, health research is not the only research domain. So we have neighbors, for instance, humanities, the people on the social sciences on the right. But we also have uh, neighbors uh, on the left, uh, not, uh, not, not, not pictured here on the cartoon, but for instance, the more uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, life sciences uh, you can find over there. Uh, and and uh, actually that all, all of these initiatives need uh, support on the more basic uh, data and organizational levels. So if we then focus a little bit on this blue square uh, that represents HealthRI, um, what this uh, shows is that actually HealthRI um, is not starting from scratch, but actually is an initiative that has um, been moving forward, building on uh, lots of different initiatives, including the S3 programs, the national notes of that, uh, for instance, the trade project funded by CTMM, but also uh, uh, the, um, the, the Dutch Cancer Society and, and many others. Um, and and um, many of the um, logos that you see here still refer to um, indeed infrastructure initiatives, but we're also teaming up with um, clinical initiatives like, for instance, the Dutch uh, Clinical Research Foundation, uh, um, the Dutch Cardiovascular Alliance, and the uh, Dutch Oncology Research Platform. So uh, that's why, how, and uh, how we have come to here. And uh, this is where I hand over to Leon. First, can I, can I ask you a question? Because you are one of the founding fathers of Health Arai. They say so. <laughs> <laughs> they say so. <laughs> this picture reminds me of the center of gravity of things happening. Um, What's, what's your personal feeling looking back and looking forward? Um, yeah, so I think um, that the situation where we are now and also what is um, kind of uh, illustrated with this cartoon is that, um, yeah, we wouldn't have gotten this far if uh, there would not have been a broad sense of urgency uh, to solve this problem. Uh, and, and apparently... Um, and, and we've seen that before on, on earlier occasions, M many people and initiatives um, uh, recognize the problem and they, um, uh, they also um, yeah, uh, agree with uh, the way to move forward. And I think that the main thing that we've been able to do as HealthRI is, is to, um, to actually um, use this as a crystallization point and, and build from there. And it's great to see with so many people actually teaming up um, also today in this meeting to, uh, to get us moving. So uh, I can't imagine anything else than this should also be very convincing for uh, the people in The Hague deciding <laughs> on the, uh, uh, the Gruyfonds project. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, this shows that we as a field are ready, uh, ready for this. Uh, ready, uh, ready to rumble. Uh, ready to rumble. You mentioned alignment and uh, Leona, I introduced you as the chief executive officer, but I think you could also be easily be introduced as the chief alignment officer, I would say. Uh. Oh, yeah, I think yeah, this is a good point. I think, well, linking share stakeholders is maybe uh, uh, our most uh, most activity. Uh, it's, it's important, I think, to link all those communities. Well, like the picture, uh, Gerrit Sloos, but the picture is broader. Uh, yeah. There are uh, hundreds of, of institutions and communities and people uh, uh, we need to, be, uh, need to link and to connect. So uh, Ruben is the chief science strategic alliances, but... Uh, probably we all are. Yeah, yeah. Hey, th okay, could you stay, uh, t take us uh, with, uh, with you on the journey that you've been uh, doing the past few years and uh, moving forward as well? Yes, of course. Well, thank you. It's a, it's more a boring slide about <laughs> <laughs> organization, but uh, behind those organizations are people. Uh, I think uh, the most important thing is people, where we need to. Uh, to connect people, and uh, mm. it's I think it's also a good place to uh, do a big thank you of uh, uh, lots of people who work with us. It's I'm not sure what the English word is. It's Lieferberg our papier for all of for all of us. So uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for, and I think it's also good to see that uh, the modesty of uh, of Gerrit. Uh, I think he's he's really one of the founding fathers. Uh, I think working on uh, well maybe eight years or ten years of work. So thank you for that. 
And so we're last year we put a small organization uh, for your ID. It's, it's seven to eight uh, uh, full-time equivalents, but a lot of people uh, around in all those communities. Uh, Ruben will uh, talk about it later. And uh, we organized along the three action lines. Uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, we are now stichting a non-profit uh, foundation with a real professional governance. Uh, you see all those bodies over here. The right side, you have the strategic committee. And we're kind of proud of it. It's, it's a broad range of, uh, uh, of uh, organization, of umbrella organizations, uh, who is in the strategic committee and given us uh, advice. Uh, like uh, there's uh, uh, like the hospitals, but also uh, we have now the health insurance uh, on the board, uh, but also uh, an umbrella organization of the of the pharma and uh, a lot of other organization. And on the left side, you have the science and technology board and community board. And uh, Ruben will uh, talk later about it. Uh, and we are now also in the beginning of establishing regional health Rhine nodes. And it's the first step, but I think it's an important step to uh, establish those nodes. And uh, Vero will talk about it later. And uh, well, of course, this was last year was the year, and also this year is uh, uh, the year of the pandemic of, of COVID-19. And we developed an, uh, a data portal along with uh, Sonam V. Uh, Vero will talk about later, but we had a, a lot of lessons learned. And for us, it, I think it was a good sign that it's not easy to implement uh, uh, such a portal. And it's also a good uh, thing that we can work together with a lot of institutions uh, to get uh, data fair uh, in, 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 in the institutions. And, uh, and another thing is also we made some, thing, I think, uh, important steps toward uh, LC aspects. We had uh, uh, some fruitful uh, discussions about consent and about the data governance specific for COVID-19, but we can also use it broader uh, for uh, other data. Um. Well, um, this is about connecting stakeholders. Echi, you, 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 tell, you uh, had a question about it. Uh, I think that's our most important activity. And well, hopefully we're now one of the spokespersons on, uh, on the reuse uh, of, uh, of data and samples and imaging. And uh, it's, I think it's an honor to, to have that role. And we don't have a formal mandate of uh, authority, but uh, we like to have that role. And we, we speak to a lot of uh, institutions and uh, also uh, more with uh, silos of the healthcare data, uh, institutions like SIN, uh, RIVM, uh, but also uh, NICTIS, and well, there are a lot of organization in the ecosystem of uh, healthcare data. Um, and I think an, an other important aspect is that we need to go to a sustainable uh, healthcare um, uh, data infrastructure, so you need also to, uh, uh, to I think, to develop sustainable models for it, not only for the infrastructure itself, but also for uh, for services. And uh, well, we are learning about it. And last year we uh, had some uh, uh, implement some pricing model for uh, the, what we call trade services, but also for our service desk. And I think uh, that's the first step for a sustainable model for an, an infrastructure. And last but not least, we involve a lot of new partners, uh, not only uh, institutions, but also uh, partners uh, uh, like companies, like uh, the pharma, but also partners uh, of AI. We are now a former partner of the AI coalition, and we had a good role, I think, in AI. And AI, well, it's, it's hip and happening, and you need not only data, but big data for AI. So I think it's a good uh, momentum also for, uh, for health data infrastructure. Thank you, Leona. Big data, AI, it almost comes naturally to, to uh, move towards you, uh, Viro. Uh, yeah, take us away. Uh, Leona also mentioned the Health Rhine notes, uh, and she said Viro is going to talk about it. So uh, please tell us, what have you actually been doing now with the Health Rhine infrastructure? Yes, yes uh, thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to talk about a lot of activities that I know many of the people that are now online actually have contributed to this. I think we've all been in a sort of a pressure cooker over the last year. And a lot of things for which we're working on the concepts all of a sudden became real because of COVID. Because there was such an urgent need in order to learn from data. In my hospital alone, within weeks that we knew that the pandemic was going to be very serious, we had more than 45 proposals for observational studies to learn from data from COVID patients. And the same was true, I think, all over the Netherlands and actually all over the world. 
and all the problems that you that we've been discussing for years, how are we going to reuse data both for research and innovation, came back when we had to address this COVID crisis. How do we ensure we have the legal basis to reuse the data? How do we ensure that the data are harmonized so that we can pull them and do integrated analysis of the data? If the data are from multiple institutions, what agreements do we make? What kind of governance structure is there? And I think on all those aspects, we have made tremendous uh, progress. Thanks, I think, to HealthRI and all the people like you that, have, that are contributing and are part of HealthRI. So just to name a number of the things we've achieved over the past year. So there's now a, a portal. If you go to our website, you can browse and you can see all studies that have COVID data are listed there. And you see what of type of data uh, is available in these studies. So this is a great repository to get an overview. Also, if you have a study, it's a great way to uh, ensure that the world knows what kind of data are available within your study. But of course, we want to go one step further. What we really would like to establish is the fact that we can reutilize data over multiple institutions. And with the university medical centers and also with some other hospitals, we've been working on a working group. And this is a very active uh, working group. It's uh, led by uh, Rita Azevedo and Jeroen Balian. We've been working on harmonizing data across multiple uh, uh, university medical centers and hospitals to ensure that we can uh, uh, pull them and enable them for integrated analysis. And at this moment, we have a functional prototype. I think it will be launched in the next uh, coming months. We're doing this uh, in, uh, with, in HealthRI with, uh, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the NFU, with uh, the STZ. Uh, also, we have some support of Sonem Way. So this is really an effort of multiple parties. But uh, already of thousands of patients, we have ensured that we have collected the data in a common format so that, they, that we can search those data and that we can work towards providing those data in order to support observational studies. As uh, Gerrit already indicated, we're not just about data, clinical data. Uh, when actually, if we talk about data, we always think of uh, clinical data, samples, and images. So we want to extend this portal uh, beyond uh, uh, the clinical data. And together with uh, the Dutch Society of Radiology, we've uh, uh, already established an effort in order to build a national biobank. And this national biobank is a national image biobank, which will make image data available. And later in the program, in the, the parallel sessions, both on the COVID portal and on this national image data bank, there's going to be presentations by Jeroen Belien and Jan Jaap Vissers. So if you're interested in that, please join for those sessions. So I talked about the uniform data collection between UMCs, but once you've uni unified or uni made this uh, data, uh, uh, um, data preparation uniform, you want to really share them. But sharing data across institutions requires rules on who can access the data, under what conditions, etc. And we're really proud that we have established uh, uh, across all uh, uh, the university medical centers a, a template uh, with the idea of a data, a national data access committee in order to uh, uh, have a data governance procedure it, which is going to be transparent such that you know under what conditions, if you can search the data, on, under what conditions you can use the data to address your research question. Also, in this way, we want to ensure the quality of the, uh, the, the research we will do on, on these data. Now, a crucial aspect of building this infrastructure is that there is knowledge there where data is being collected, that the data are being collected in a fashion that they can be shared. And we've also invested and put a lot of energy in data steward uh, uh, programs in order to train and educate projects and people in order to contribute to uh, building this national data infrastructure. Now, what we've done for COVID, in a way, is, uh, is what we would like to uh, achieve with HealthRI in the bigger picture. If you think of the portal that we're building in order to reuse COVID data, you just extend the data beyond COVID data, but also in the field of oncology, cardiovascular diseases, neurological diseases, and you go beyond the university medical centers and uh, a few uh, other hospitals that we've now connected to the portal to, to connect 
all the regions and all institutes in which data are collected. And then you have sort of a blueprint of what we envision to be the health RI infrastructure, as we have also put it forward uh, in the, the Groei Fonds, the Wiebe Hoekstra Fonds. So the idea of our model is eventually is that on the national level, there will be uh, the possibility to search for data. There is going to be a catalog. But this catalog is filled because it's connected to nodes. Nodes are ensuring that they collect data in the proper way, such that they can be shared across multiple institutes. So regional nodes make known to the portal what type of data they have made available. They're being helped in order to, to harmonize the data to make them fair locally. And in this way, we can build a portal over multiple institutes and multiple regions in order to enable the reuse of data at the national scale and also uh, uh, connect uh, to uh, European and international initiatives. So this is uh, 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 the, what, we're, what we're building right now and which is also the, the basis of the infrastructure as proposed in this Wiebetoekstra funds. We will take a very pragmatic approach. I mean, if it's needed, sometimes we still collect data centrally Otherwise, they'll be uh, 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 decentral and we're going to have access, use the personal health train and go towards uh, distributed learning. But this is our vision for the, for the uh, data infrastructure that will enable a much larger reuse of data for uh, research and innovation. Thank you, Viro. Uh, and I, I gather that uh, the regional no node in, uh, around Maastricht uh, is just, uh, we've forgotten to draw the line there, right? There's still, it, it is connected to the central yeah, health line. <laughs> yeah, okay. Rest assured, wireless. Maastricht, yeah. it's, uh, it's wireless. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks, Viro. Uh, in view of the time, uh, I think we should move on to you, uh, Ruben, and uh, to have your uh, reflections on uh, where we are right now and where you want to move uh, forward. In, in the meantime, I would, just, would like to just say to the people uh, watching, I, I am seeing questions coming in right now. So I would ju just give the floor to Ruben and then I'll dive into the questions. So rest assured, I'll be back. Okay, I'll be short, uh, I think, um, hopefully. So um, as management board of, of Health Array, we really see Health Array as a platform to um, align, to tune among all kinds of organizations that are active in this field building their local solutions and as Gerrit said of course you could talk about fragmentation but we know that many uh, organizations already are want to move in a similar direction we need to have health ri as a as a binding factor to build that federated national health data infrastructure that uh, vio has just been describing and in which uh, we will uh, work with local um, regional nodes in the country and connect it internationally so <clears throat> there's quite a few um, types of stakeholders that we need to have around the table. Of course, first of all, communities um, working on health um, from the perspective of various types of disease mechanisms or uh, public health and lifestyle and prevention. Also very important to get to preventive mecha mechanisms uh, of stimulating health and, pre and preventing disease. Um, of course, in our network, the local organizations and regional, some, sometimes regionally organized uh, networks are very important to get around the table. Um, but equally so, organizations, initiatives, infrastructures that already are operating at the, at the national level. So connecting um, groups, connecting organizations, uh, the stakeholders that you have here on the left, but then in national networks. And of course, we don't want to, to have Health Array be a silo as such, as a Dutch entity that, that, that doesn't connect. So, of course, we work in the scope of the European global infrastructure on health and health-related uh, information and data. Um, one aspect that, that we need to try and arrange for, in, indeed, if we want to build this federated national health data infrastructure, is that, it needs to, uh, that we need to create a working mechanism. How, how can we make uh, this multi-stakeholder environment run, indeed, uh, in, in delivering this federated national health data infrastructure? Luckily, uh, as I said, all these parties already are, are doing part of the job. So it's, it's our task now within the programme to really make sure that we align uh, and that we bring uh, together the agreement into 
um, the, the framework, the, the trust framework, as Gerrit introduced earlier, so that we talk about the mechanisms of how to share data, how to make them accessible in the institutes, uh, if needed, indeed centralize them into, into national resources. Um, currently, in many of the larger research organizations, we see the development of so-called digital competence centers. This has been stimulated by NWO. Um, and this is one of the mechanisms in which we can tie in, uh, talk to easier to these institutes through their data competence centers. Of course, apart from the, the uh, policy level, but very much focusing on those uh, um, uh, experts and, and units in these organizations that already are taking care of their local infrastructure. Similarly, um, um, working with national infrastructures, Gerrit mentioned, of course, the, the founders uh, of HealthRI, uh, BBMRI NL, Elixir NL, Eatris NL, so nodes in international infrastructures, uh, but also cross omics. We will have a presentation of, of Alain van Gogh about this later in the conference. These are the entities that we tie into this infrastructure, making sure that we, um, uh, in fact, choose similar in a similar direction, the way that we would like to uh, provide access to the data. Um, national research networks, um, Leona was, was, in, was alluding to the AI coalition that we're involved in, uh, the bioinformatics research network. This is the type of, of um, uh, entities and organizations that we have around the table. I want to point at the open science aspect of Health Array. Uh, because, of course, uh, Health Array working on, on human health data um, and, and finding solutions to share data across multi-stakeholders um, takes, uh, uh, delivers solutions, but also adopts solutions that are being shared. Fair data, of course, are, are key to what we're talking about. And in the context of the national program Open Science, uh, Health Array is really one of the stakeholders. Um, operating in this biomedical field and in the health and the broader health field, but very much as a partner in that national open science program, so to say. Having said that, FAIR data, uh, we're talking about personal data. FAIR is, of course, uh, means that data are not necessarily open. They cannot be open if they're very personal. So this is the connotation. FAIR does not mean that data are open. They are unaccepted, sorry, accessible under well-defined conditions. And that's exactly what the trust framework um, uh, contains. Similarly, in open science, we link to uh, the European infrastructure on open science, the European open science cloud, and to, uh, I, I already mentioned Elixir, uh, BBMRI and Eatris, to European research infrastructures. Now, in order to really um, work then, align all these people around the topics that we need to uh, to work on in this trust framework, we are as working in a, in a multi-community uh, environment. So we have set up in, in the recent year, especially not only the foundation, but also active communities of experts working on health and clinical data, um, but also on the imaging data, the, the multi-omics data. So experts in these fields uh, already gathered in, in existing communities. Later on in the program, you will see presentations of these communities. And similarly, of the communities working on the biobanks. So this is the, the containers of data that Gerrit talked about. Uh, it's the life containers of data, but also on the ethical, legal and societal issue, issues. So the LC community is dealing with this. FAIR, the implementation of FAIR in uh, a, a large and ever-growing data stewardship community is also um, uh, around the table and is being organized very actively in the framework of, of Health Array. Um, then uh, Jeroen Belien uh, will talk about the IT and data architecture. Uh, he and his colleagues are organizing this community of stakeholders uh, really to, to design the framework of how we actually uh, move around uh, algorithms to data, how we are going to move around data, how we connect the local and national and regional infrastructures also to the international infrastructure. Federated and distributed or, dis or, or uh, distributed analysis and, and learning is of course the promise of the future. Data will be staying where they are uh, increasingly and algorithms will start visiting the data 
in the personal health trained community, this uh, activity and this, this development is, is taken alive. Um, and the community that is going to present itself this afternoon um, is, is working on the models to do so. And finally, uh, we see Health RI very much as a training and capacity building environment. Um, so we will stimulate um, uh, a lot of the capacity building in these areas uh, that are listed here. These are the binding factors that, that tie in all the organizations, all the, um, the stakeholders that we have in Health RI. And in doing so, we want to get further than just sharing expertise, which is a useful, a very useful, but doesn't get as far if we want to get to this National Federated Health Data Infrastructure. We also need to work on shared development. And that's exactly what the communities that I just uh, introduced um, are, are for. Um, Tying this to the, the, uh, the governance structure of the Health RI organization, we ha now have a community board and a science te and technology board. And the communities that I just showed are represented also at that level, so that as a, as, uh, within the Health RI organization, it is easy for us to oversee uh, the developments in these various topics um, and make sure that we have a very effective uh, organization. Thanks, Good. Ruben. Um, I have questions here. You, you, you showed a very promising future. We also promised people to have a coffee break. I'm getting the messages here. We don't do a coffee break. I would suggest we do a coffee break. Well, I'll go quickly through the questions because we have some questions, for instance, from Kai and Ruud and Merik and Frank. Some questions about who defines linking standards. Is this the communities that actually uh, are, are, are in, in, in the driver's seat of uh, defining the link? Uh, no, it's us. It's you no, and then no. uh, the, the, the work. <laughs> of course. It's the communities. They will yeah. be the communities. You're yeah. the chiefs. Those are, they are the Indians. Um, <laughs> then, uh, then two questions from Ruth and Merik is about linking to other uh, health domains. So not only medical domain, but also long-term care. And, and the question from Merik is also not only health care, but also other, let's say, welfare domains. Is, is this foreseeable? Um, and uh, would this be something that could be addressed maybe in the personal health training session later? Linking to other would, initiatives? So, uh, um, Health RI is an interoperability environment. And as I said, it will not be a silo in itself. It will not be a silo nationally in the context of other European health data infrastructures, uh, but also not uh, indeed to other areas of, of society even. Yeah. Gerrit uh, already showed in the beginning the link to the, uh, the, the uh, societal, so the social and humanities, um, uh, scientific and societal um, um, community. And this is exactly, I think, what we need to uh, make sure is that the data types, that the research uh, that is going to be cross-disciplinary uh, um, in, in the future is facilitated by uh, taking standards that make us easy to make those crossovers to other domains. Thanks. Uh, for the people watching, you have until 13.45 to get your coffee and make about <laughs> 100 steps, okay? So together we can make over 50,000 steps, so go for it. We will keep on talking and answering questions, but at 13.45 we'll move to the community pitches. This way we can have a coffee break for people that want it. You need to go now, and we can also discuss the questions and keep on going. Frank uh, uh, Leus answered, uh, asked the question, will infectious diseases also be part of the Federated National Health Data Infrastructure? I think you answered it in part, but maybe this also relates to what Vero has been showing. Yes, <clears throat> in principle, any uh, field of science in which you would like to utilize health data in order to address a scientific question or would like to innovate towards personal medicine uh, uh, would fit. And we see that there's quite interesting... Uh, uh, developments possible if we start to link uh, patient level data, societal data to, for example, virology data. One of the things we're working on is now to uh, better link our research on the virus towards linking of the uh, research of the patient population that has been exposed to the virus. Yeah. So these are definitely those areas in which this infrastructure is going to be crucial to address questions that we at this moment cannot yet address because we cannot link the data. This also comes back to your innovation gap picture, perhaps. Yeah, so uh, what, you, what you can see at this point in time that, uh, that uh, we, have, we see a great achievement of industry producing uh, vaccines at a speed that, uh, that we've never seen before. But at the same time, uh, there are many questions 
uh, now coming up uh, in in uh, in what order um, the vaccines should be given, uh, how effective are they, uh, which uh, people are um, more predisposed to having uh, severe disease courses. All of that require actually infrastructures like we have. And, and yeah, getting back to infectious diseases, I think what we've been doing on and what we've been able to do on, on Corona already last year demonstrates that uh, this is not only explicitly in scope, but that we are also making great progress there already. Uh, more than confident for the future that this infrastructure will help us to at yeah, least uh, be, be uh, capable to answer questions in the future. So basically, there's there's not really uh, really an alternative for uh, innovation in in healthcare uh, um, for uh, for using uh, health data. Uh, so we're not going to get innovations if we do not use health uh, data. Thank you. The founding father has spoken. <laughs> um, thank you to the chiefs again, uh, Geert Meijer, Leone Flikker, Veronice, and Ruben Kok. Uh, it's 13.45. Everybody that, had, that needed coffee or tea or something else is back. I hope you managed to do the 100 steps. <laughs> and now I would like to invite uh, Jeroen Bellien. Uh, you've been mentioned quite a few times already to uh, present the first community architecture in IT. And remember, these community uh, pitches, they are pitches, they are, they are like teasers to lure you into the networking part, right? So uh, after 15.30, you can go towards these communities also in the network app and get more and more information and uh, be part of the, the discussion there. So Jeroen, the floor is yours. I hope. Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, the host is now uh, muting myself. So sorry for the delay. <laughs> I was already afraid that I uh, giving an elevator pitch uh, and given this current uh, situation, I was alone in the elevator. Uh, but good afternoon all. Um, my name is Jeroen Belia. I'm the community manager of Health uh, and the architecture and IT community. Uh, and employed at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, so in the upcoming five minutes, I would like to introduce you and promote the architecture and IT community. Um, and uh, given already the, the nice discussions uh, going on in the chat, it's clear that the input will be your concrete questions and challenges from the health domain. Uh, all uh, contributing together to one common goal Namely, as Vero already pointed out, and uh, uh, Gerrit, Leone, and uh, Riemann as well, a national health data infrastructure that is accessible for all and has a common shared architecture. Um, the setup of this architecture is preferably federated, as pointed by Vero and Ruben, but also centralized when necessary. And it will be interfacing to similar national and international health data infrastructures, as already was discussed in the chat by uh, uh, questions from uh, Yildao and Kai, uh, as well as Merrick. Uh, our preferred method of operation is that we will think big, start small, but act now. So concrete uh, questions need to be uh, solved. Uh, we work demand-driven, so your questions in small working groups on uh, prioritized and manageable sub-problems. This team is uh, uh, foremost multidisciplinary, so no, not only architects, but also domain experts, specialists, etc. And we'll be collaborating with the other health RI communities, which will be presented after me. Lastly, architecture is not static. We would like to uh, follow a dynamic process that creates, but also maintains the community. Next slide, please. So if you would like to have more information, please visit this website and you will be uh, given it. The community is open and inclusive and we need you to make it happen. So please contact me if you would like to participate, contribute or be informed. Next slide, please. As stated by Gerrit, we don't start from scratch. In this case, the architecture and IT community has its roots in the uh, NFU Data for Life Science program, as well as many other research programs or research infrastructures. 
And the remainder of the slide is just a list to show you which topic has been worked on or we are still working on with a main uh, use case given the last year, uh, as we call it, the booster use case as uh, been presented by Vero as well, is the COVID-19 health data portal of which you see a screenshot of the current version. Next slide, please. Um, and here I would like to conclude the introduction of the uh, community and invite you to join our excellent, of course, interactive workshop. Well, you will be doing an interactive, uh, uh, let's we call it a yellow note uh, session uh, at 1515. And if you don't want to join, please join another session. And hopefully, uh, if the session is of your interest, you would like to become our linking pin or participant for that topic in our community. And again, if you want to have uh, join or participate or have questions, please contact me via the network app or send me a mail. That's it. Over. Thank you, Jeroen. Impressive. The timing is flawless. And uh, I like your uh, calling out to the network to join your session or any other session and at least stay in contact. So thank you for that. Um, no questions coming in for this particular point. Uh, so uh, let's move on to the next one which is uh, Peggy Manders uh, talking about the community of the Biobank. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, all of you, I want to welcome you at the Biobank community flash talk. Um, I need to uh, do it uh, as good as uh, Jeroen did, so I give it a go. My name is Peggy Manders and uh, I'm the community manager of the Biobank community. And I would like to have the next slide, please. Uh, the Biobank community wants to realize a collaborative network of all local Biobank facility, but also of the population as well as the clinical Biobanks, plus the cohort studies. And the community wants to provide support on uh, uh, strategic and operational topics. We also want to connect local communities with national and international developments. We want to try to solve overarching challenges and we want to create synergy between all different stakeholders involved in biobanking. Next slide, please. The uh, biobank community is uh, facilitated by uh, Jörg Hamann, who is uh, working at the Amsterdam UMC and is also uh, a director of uh, Parelsnoer, and myself, and I'm the head of the Central Biobank Facility of the Radboud University Medical Center. And we want to invite all stakeholders uh, involved in biobanking to join the biobank community. Because in order to put all our goals into practice, we need collaboration of all stakeholders. And when we talk of, uh, about stakeholders, we mean uh, 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 infrastructures, we mean researchers, but we also mean patients. Uh, and certainly do not forget the other health right communities, because only by joining uh, and, and uh, uh, working together, we can actually uh, make things happen. Next slide, please. Uh, first of all, we want to expand the uh, Parelsnoer's uh, existing uh, platforms, uh, which are the Biobank platform and the IT data platform. And they, uh, these platforms should address, among other things, uh, uh, realization and implementation of evidence-based standard operating procedures for the uh, specifically the handling of uh, um, storage of the biomaterial that is being collected by the biobanks. Um, the platforms should uh, create awareness of the importance of pre-analysis um, they should support multi-center consortia and participate in national and international initiatives. And they should also advise on the development of tools and their local implementation. Uh, within these uh, platforms, there should be uh, room to start thematic working groups. Uh, these working groups should be temporary and they should tackle various issues on a uh, project basis in close collaboration with other health right communities. And we also want to appoint delegates to structurally represent the biobank community within the other communities, for example, the LC communities, because there are a lot of overlapping issues uh, we are dealing with. Next slide, please. 
Um, and by uh, finishing my uh, flash talk, we uh, I want you to invite to uh, join our uh, breakout session uh, this afternoon. Jurgen Man will present the contours of the community and Eric Vermeulen will tell you more about the patient perspective. If you want to know more about this community or you want to uh, contribute or uh, play a, a, another different role, please visit our website or contact me uh, by email. You can all, uh, also send me a, a, a message uh, by using the chat. And now I want to thank you for your attention and enjoy, enjoy the Health Rai conference. Thank you. Peggy, equally impressive. Thank you. The, you, you uh, also, the timing is flawless. So uh, <laughs> I'm very impressed. Uh, and also, of course, about the content. Uh, hopefully, you managed to lure a lot of people to your sessions. Um, now moving on towards the next one, uh, which is data stewardship. And I would like to invite Irina van Dijk, all the way from Utrecht, I presume, or around that region, to uh, give their flash talk or a pitch or teaser, whatever you want to call it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Irina van Dijk and together with Maike Jette and Barend Mons, I represent the data stewardship community. And yeah, let me start off with my most important message. Uh, data stewards are extremely valuable partners in research and healthcare, and we should demonstrate our value united as one. And next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the term data steward, uh, data stewards stand side by side with data creators and data users to make data as valuable as possible. Uh, for example, data stewards stand side by side with researchers to support them from the absolute beginning of a research project until after the project has finished. And their work, their work really helps to make data fair and usable beyond the lifespan of a single project. Uh, in our community, we bring data stewards together from different institutes to accelerate the implementation of data stewardship to share good practices and to tackle cross-institutional challenges together. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, and in this community of healthcare data stewards, uh, we originated actually from a previous uh, DTL group. And now we continue in the same group under the umbrella of HealthRI. And in our community, uh, we already have representatives of all UMCs and many other health right partners, including SURF. Uh, and in our meetings, we have ample room for discussions and we regularly ask our members to share their uh, successes and challenges with the group. And this way, we identify common grounds for, uh, for collaborations where possible. Next slide, please. Uh, because one great example of us really working together as one strong community is related to a funding opportunity for digital competence centers, as Ruben Koch also uh, mentioned in his talk. And during this call for proposals, uh, the community organized several brainstorm sessions. Uh, we read each other's proposals and also provided each other feedback. And in the end, uh, this teamwork really paid off as all proposals were accepted and also rewarded with the funding. For the coming year, we have several focus areas, as you can see on this slide, and those areas include training, research tooling, and data publishing and archival. And that brings us to the last slide. Because in our breakout session today, uh, one of our members will give us a sneak peek into their data stewardship training. And in our breakout session, we, uh, we also use an online whiteboard uh, to hear from you and your experiences with data stewardship. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to invite you all to our upcoming uh, focus meeting on data publishing and archival. Uh, you can register online for this meeting that is on uh, March 25th. Um, you can also take uh, have a look at our Health Arrive website, and over there you can also find all contact details. And for now, I wish you all a great and inspiring event, and I hope to meet you later.
in the data stewardship breakout session. Thank you, Irina, uh, for this nice uh, presentation. I was wondering, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're there still, but uh, I was wondering if you could share already one of the best practices you mentioned, or is this something you, you will save for the breakout session? <laughs> I think this is a uh, good season for the breakout session. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, okay. It's related to training, so come there and you will see it. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for the cliffhanger. Um, well, thank you, Irina, again. Uh, moving on then to the next community, uh, maybe 10 seconds ahead of time, but I hope Susanne is uh, ready. Susanne Reber. Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you, Eke. Take it away from the LC community. Thank you. So uh, I would like to present the LC community to you. Uh, my name is Susanne Rebers and I am the community manager of the LC community. Uh, next slide, please. As you know, uh, researchers need to take a lot of hurdles before they can start their research. And actually one of the most difficult hurdles to tackle is the LC hurdle. So uh, how to deal with ethical, legal and societal issues. And especially when different organizations work together, they have different interpretations of the laws, of regulations, of codes of conduct. And this leads to different policies and it really hinders collaborative research. So the LC community therefore aims to contribute to the harmonization of these LC policies between Dutch hospitals and research institutions by first of all fostering and facilitating cooperation on LC issues based on specific practical use cases. Uh, one of them, of course, will be the federated data infrastructure of HealthRide and by bringing together the community regularly for informative meetings uh, to keep all stakeholders up to date with recent developments and to foster interaction and collaboration. And uh, next slide, please. So who are we? Um, the commun community leader and manager are uh, Professor Marianka Schmidt here in front of the picture and me, Susanne Rebers. Next slide, please. Well, formally, we haven't started building the LC community yet. But of course, as you probably know, there's already a large community of stakeholders in the Netherlands, which really reflect the LC community. And very important in this respect are uh, the networks uh, and members of the LC service desk, Corion, the Privacy, Ethics and Law Working Group of the Netherlands Federation of University Medical Centers and the Science Coordinators of the STZ Hospitals. Next slide, please. In the past years, we, we've built a very strong LC network in the Netherlands through the LC Service Desk. We were able to provide many researchers with information about LC issues or provide an answer to their question. Uh, further, we organized many both offline and online LC workshops that were very well attended. The next few years, we want to work on building the LC community further, defining priorities together with, for instance, the other uh, health right communities. And we want to bring together relevant stakeholders where necessary to work on the practical interpretation of laws, regulations and guidelines. And further, of course, we will organize meetings to facilitate sharing of information and discussion. Next slide, please. Well, as you probably know, LC is everywhere. So you could go to, to any session or any poster today and find a lot of LC issues. But I would specifically like to uh, highlight two sessions. First of all, the Corion session, um, which will be about the new code of conduct. And on the picture, you see the old one, of course, because the new one is not ready yet. Uh, and secondly, to the LC community session in which uh, Robert Verheij and Petra Wilson will discuss, discuss uh, the imp implementation of the GDPR for health uh, data in different EU member states. And further, there are two really interesting posters that I would like to refer you to. First of all, poster 44 on the service desk community. And secondly, the poster number one of Miriam Beusink called Health Research with Data in a Time of Privacy. What information do patients want? Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanne. Uh, I also have a question for you about the LC Service Desk. You also mentioned it, the LC Service Desk community. This makes me curious. Uh, what kind of questions come towards the LC, LC Service Desk? Maybe you can give a, a short introduction there uh, or a short answer there but also the, the service desk community. It sounds like you're helping each other. 
Yeah, so the LC Service Desk helps uh, researchers with first finding information through our website on LC issues. So ethical, legal, social issues on uh, observational research, health research. Uh, and if there's no answer to your question on the website, people can actually submit a question and one of our experts will then uh, provide an answer to this, this question. Um, your next question was on the service desk community. So there are different service desks, of course, within the health uh, infrastructure, and we want to work together to really make it easy for researchers to find the information they want. No matter where you start your question, you will, as a community, make sure that you end up in the right place to get the answer you're looking for. Exactly. Oh, perfect. Thanks a lot, Susanna, for this uh, great talk. Um, um, moving on to the next one about the imaging community. And I would like to invite Stefan Klein uh, from around the Rotterdam area, probably, to, uh, to give us a, a short introduction there. Yes, uh, thank you um, for the introduction. I'm indeed from Rotterdam, um, so from the Erasmus uh, MC. And I have the honor to, to announce to you the, the Health Array image community. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the, the imaging community is all about medical imaging. So you're all familiar with MRI scans, CT scans, ultrasound, PET. And you know probably that they play a, a crucial role in clinical care and also in clinical research studies. And from these images, they, 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 contain, they contain a lot of information that you can view with your eyes, but actually uh, with the computer. And next slide, please we can extract uh, even much more information out of these images. For example, we can extract quantitative biomarkers, we can segment structures, and we can even go from an image directly to a diagnosis or say something about biological properties of what we are imaging. And for that, we use a lot of machine learning techniques and AI uh, that, that, yeah, in which models are trained based on large amounts of data. And that actually ha uh, has, made, has turned radiology you could say almost from a clinical science or medical science into a data science. Uh, and that comes with challenges. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So yeah, I, here I listed some of the infrastructural challenges in medical imaging research. First, uh, especially in multi-center studies, you have to collect data from multiple sites. Uh, then very importantly, you, you, uh, before you do any research on it, you have to anonymize them, or actually you, you should do that even before collecting them. Um, uh, then typically data is, uh, is, uh, could be a mess if you get it from different uh, sources. So then we need, to, uh, yeah, we need tools to clean up the data and structure it. Uh, we need to store it in a central place or locally. Uh, the, we need mechanisms to share data with, with researchers in a secure way. We need tools for data inspection and uh, annotation and also for, so visually basically, but also for automated processing and, and analysis and to, to train these machine learning models and for integrating it with other types of data because imaging is of course never used on its own. It's always linked to clinical data or genetic data or, or whatever. And all these, these processes we have to do in a traceable and a reproducible way. Uh, next slide, please. So to uh, it would be a waste of time if, if each of us uh, tackles these challenges on its own. Uh, so we have uh, decided to set up the Health Array Imaging Community, uh, which has as the main goal to, to jointly tackle these infrastructural challenges in medical Im imaging research. Um, next slide, please. Um, as an example of our past and actually cur yeah, our current activities uh, that were already started in, uh, since five years, um, is the uh, setup of an image anonymization pipeline based on the clinical trial processor software, which is a, yeah, a secure way and a, and a, yeah, a standardized way to anonymize uh, data, anonymize DICOM data, and send it to a, uh, yeah, from one place to another. Um, and a second very important uh, achievement was the setup of the image data storage uh, based on XNAT. So XNAT is a platform for uh, storage and sharing of medical image data. Uh, so, and the, the, the current central uh, instance of that, xnat.bmia.nl, uh, contains data from 90 studies, uh, a lot of multi-center studies, very large studies. And in total, there's data of uh, more than 60,000 imaging sessions stored on it. So that's really in production. So that's already an achievement. Um, next slide, please. 
Yeah, um, the, the the activities in the for the future or what that we are currently working on is to turn this central X knot that we now have uh, to transform it into a network, a federated network of of different X knots at the different centers because we believe that is more scalable for the future huh? and also it it solves some 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 issues huh? when data huh? when people don't uh, prefer to share data. Um, so this, there's a close link there with uh, with the personal health train in the community. Um, yeah, so so this is one of the the challenges to make sure that every center has its own XNOT archive. Uh, second, we want to link the storage to to uh, convenient tools for image annotation and processing, and also for uh, and integrated with other types of data and and uh, yeah, uh, allow machine learning on this kind of data. Next slide, please. Oh, um, yeah. So the community is potentially extremely broad because, of course, many people are involved in imaging. First of all, radiologists, but also so for storing this data, we need IT experts. And then there's many researchers in imaging physics, image analysis, machine learning that that use images or or create images. So we decided to start small and set up an XNOT knowledge exchange network. Uh, to, to achieve this first step, eh, to, uh, to uh, set up this federated XNOT network. Uh, the managers of the imaging community are, uh, are my, besides myself, are Marcel Cook from Erasmus MC, he's more on the, an ex expert in XNOT, and uh, Rita Azevedo from Ligature, who helps us with setting up this, this, with setting up this community. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, here we would like to announce the breakout session uh, this afternoon, where we will officially launch the, the the imaging community. This is the first like formal event of it, even though the community are actually already existed informally before. So you're very welcome to attend. We will, uh, for the people who are not so familiar with XNOT yet, we'll give a brief introduction on it, uh, highlight some of its features, um, and then we uh, we would like to discuss some practical aspects like finding the, the uh, appointing the right contact persons at each uh, center uh, and and brainstorming about uh, activities that we could have like uh, tutorials uh, training sessions etc um, uh, next I would like to point you to some some interesting demos and posters it's number seven it's a demo a demonstration of how to integrate image analysis pipelines into Xnot uh, then there's a few posters, one on, uh, that show, uh, describes a use case on distributed image analysis, and two there are from Groningen, where they also are, have a lot of experience with XNOT. Um, and then in, yeah, uh, in about an hour, there's the, uh, the sh showcase talk on COVID-19 by uh, Dr. Jan Jaap Visser, where also uh, XNOT was used as one of the uh, components to, to make it happen. Um, yeah, so I would like to, uh, I hope to see many of you at the breakout session this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Finally, someone that runs over time. Thanks for that. Uh, but <laughs> thank you for your very enthusiastic uh, talk. Um, you mentioned somewhere along the way that it could, could, it could be a mess if you collect data from different sources. I think that shows that you're a very positive uh, person because you <laughs> use a very euphemistic way of phrasing this. But uh, thanks for now. Uh, I'm moving on towards uh, Alain van Gool, uh, who has been uh, waiting, of course, uh, for his uh, time to, uh, to, to shine, his, uh, uh, to introduce the community of the OMICS, the OMICS NL community. So please, uh, Alain, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll make it shorter than five minutes, but uh, can I have the next slide? Because I want to introduce, that's not the right slide. <laughs> it's a different slide there, guys. Um, and now I see myself. Uh, yeah. What slide were you hoping for, Alain? Well, I have four slides and this is the main, because I wanted to introduce everyone to the to the breakout later, where we'll introduce the Netherlands Cross Omics Initiative and those were the slides of that, right? Ah. Um, while we're waiting for the other slides, I would like to invite everyone to the breakout session on the Omics community. And also there, like Gerrit indicated, we're not starting from scratch. We got a lot of historical Omics communities in the Netherlands name it the Netherlands Proteomics Center, Metabolomics Center, Genomics Initiative, um, and now recently also the Crossomics Initiative, but also the BBMRI Omics community. And we're trying to bring all those together to discuss our shared points of interest. Um, 
I can also share my screen if you like, but uh, uh, I'll do it without. I'm, I'm also um, just, uh, let's say, the facilitator, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some slides being flashed, but you're not seeing it, right? Um, nope. Technology, is there, is there, sorry? I have not Oh, you can share your slides, Alain, go ahead. Can I? Okay, let me do Thanks. That. Let me see that, da, 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 da. just a second. Yeah, of course, we were hoping for something like this to happen, because this makes it... <laughs> so thanks, uh, Alain, and uh, thanks, uh, everybody. No problem. no problem. I think you would see my slides. Is it building up the tension here. This is really building yeah. up the tension. That's right. I'm uh, I'm staring at a, a camera while in the meantime seeing myself on a screen, which is of course just very in, uh, uh, uncomfortable. But um, yes, I see some slides. Oh, those are not your slides. Uh, these these must be the slides. People from uh, technology, uh, is it working now? If it's okay, you should see something. I'm I'm uh, I'm not seeing it. Ah, yes, now I see something. Go ahead. Very good. So um, the main thing which we uh, wanted to do in our community is to talk about our shared interests in omics technologies, uh, the data and the applications. So what you can see on this slide is uh, uh, four points of interest that we collectively already have been having for the past 20 years. Um, and particularly the data generation, which is the second bullet, is becoming more and more important. We have a biomedical focus, which is the third bullet, which distinguishes us in the health or eye context versus the other omics communities where you can sequence uh, bacteria and uh, tomatoes as well. But we focus on the technology applications, which is the fourth bullet, which is the major uh, drivers that we are aiming for better health outcomes uh, by combining omics data with other patient data. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, let me move that. So um, we have five main objectives, which we're going to discuss in our community breakout later. And the objectives are quite simple, that we want to organize the Netherlands at large uh, as a health or eye omics community to better participate in European initiatives that are, that are large scale. So the one million genome uh, will be discussed later, uh, but also on a national initiative like we have the large scale research infrastructures, how shall we move forward as a Netherlands in those initiatives? Uh, the Goeifonds was already mentioned. And particularly, we are kind of organized also in the DTL format, but we'd like to improve that by just uh, mapping our capabilities and specializations, which are very relevant for mapping the Netherlands at large in European frameworks. Um, foremost, we want to provide a meeting place for young talent and old talent, obviously, to discuss these research technologies, but also very much provide and communicate clinical applications of the multi-omics approaches. Now, to do that, we have made a very simple program later where André Outerlinde uh, will introduce the community and some more details. Uh, Ruben Koch will outline the One Million Genome Initiative. I will outline the Netherlands cross Omics Initiative. And finally, we'll work with the whole group actually on several discussions points facilitated by André and Joyce from Meurs and uh, the five of us together with Malijn and Ilse from, uh, from Ligature and uh, Health Array. Uh, will facilitate this community. And that's where I want to keep it. Thank you. Much for your flexibility and uh, ability to uh, even, uh, given the starting problems, uh, give a very clear presentation and uh, hopefully uh, get people into your sessions that you pointed them to. Uh, last but not least, we're moving on to the personal health train, where I would like to ask Gijs Gelijnse to give a short presentation. Hopefully it works. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, there we go. So I'm Gijs Gelijnse. I'm a senior clinical data scientist at IKNL. That's the Netherlands Comprehensive Cancer Organization in English and Integraal Kankercentrum Nederland in Dutch. And it's my pleasure to talk uh, for five minutes or so about the personal health train community. If we go to the next slide. Then we see cheering people, very proud. And this was Health Array 2020, quite some time ago, it seems. And uh, what we did there is we uh, uh, used the conference as a platform to officially uh, uh, depart the personal health train. 
And for those who weren't there, um, I think we're with 600 or so today. So I can imagine not everyone is yet familiar. The personal health train is what we say a collective term for technologies and agreements that enable uh, the decentralized analysis of health data. So what we mean with that is that we aim to keep data locally at their organization while enabling the analysis of data uh, remotely. So data stays with the organization, uh, insights and statistics travel, and the privacy of the, uh, the patient is preserved. If we go to the next slide, then we see that after health ri um, where we held hands and we had some bit of ballen uh, we went to working we went working uh, 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 on the agreements on the technology and we applied them in real life use cases uh, to learn about health and care and uh, what excites us at the end of the day and uh, it was a very festive and uh, successful year uh, you can read about that in some of the articles on our website uh, and we had something to celebrate as well because the personal health train won the computable award for a best healthcare innovation in the year 2020. So that made us proud and, uh, and uh, we had some, some drinks as you can see there. Um, if we go to the next slide, then we will talk a little bit about the different use cases that are supported by the personal health train. And this is the first scenario that is, uh, let's say, the, the easiest one to explain and maybe also the simplest one from a technical point of view. Suppose you have one organization that holds a fair data point and there is a uh, scientist or a, uh, um, a stakeholder who is interested in insights from that data. Then the personal health train will enable them to send a train to the data station, execute the analysis with the data and retrieve the insights. So data on patient level stays at the organization while the research, uh, researcher or the stakeholder can learn from the data nevertheless. So uh, everybody wins. Next scenario, a bit more complicated. On the next slide, there we go. So now we don't have one, but we have multiple organizations. And what we say here is that the data is horizontally partitioned. And what we mean with that is that we assume that the organizations uh, maintain data from different sets of patients, yet with the same kind of data elements. And maybe in this scenario, we want to learn about the difference in quality indicators, and we need to do some complex case mix corrections. Then usually you would pull that data with a technology called federated learning that is supported by the personal health train, uh, the researcher or the stakeholder is enabled to analyze the data with the data remaining locally at the sites. In this example, in Taiwan, the Netherlands and in Oslo. Um, last scenario that is supported by the personal health train. And that's exactly the other way around on the next slide. There we go. So here we have a scenario where we have one group of patients where their data is distributed among different sources, uh, in this case within the Netherlands. So uh, location A has some clinical data, there may be some uh, genome data or imaging or pathology data at different sites. And we would like to benefit from the combined picture of these group of patients and learn something about this uh, uh, set of patients. Also in this scenario that has a different uh, technological uh, uh, nature, uh, the personal health train will support these kind of analysis. Albeit that here we use a technology from cryptography, like uh, multi-party computation that will help us to execute these analysis as if the data were on one site. So these are the three scenarios that we uh, worry about in the personal health train community and where we deliver technology agreements and uh, meaningful use cases. So next slide. Yeah, there we go. So um, we are moving uh, within the, the personal health train group for, uh, through a process where it started with an idea. Then we built some software to, to test that idea. That software turned into prototypes. These prototypes were uh, executed on real life use cases with real data. This is what we've done so far. We did it many times. We're getting better and better at that. We can do more and more complex stuff. And now we set ourselves the challenge for 2021 to make the jump 
from these uh, prototypes, these concepts to widespread implementation. So the idea is that together in the broad community, we worry about making the transition to uh, routine usage, widespread implementation and uh, personal health training as a, ser a service, if you like. Um, and we believe that we are ready to do so because we have a quite mature, broad community. You will discover that uh, throughout the day. Our software is maturing. Uh, we think about other aspects as well. So now is the time to make this big jump that makes us very excited. Um, if we move to the next slide, there we go. So yeah, you can feel that we need not just a community, we need a community of communities. So we are getting a quite busy and, and exciting train uh, uh, on these tracks. So we work on uh, agreements and a trust framework such that for all stakeholders involved, the personal health frame works out. Uh, technical implementations uh, that were prototypes, proof of concepts are converging. We're uh, having a technical working group to make sure that uh, technical implementations also implement these, uh, these agreements. Uh, business modeling is of course important. The innovation needs to be sustainable. And uh, last but not least, there is a scientific community that uh, worries about uh, what's next. What are uh, next use cases? What are next problems that the personal health trends should address? More difficult data, more difficult setups. That's what's uh, being discussed right there. And then if we move to the uh, final slides, there we go. So today uh, we're excited to present uh, eight posters even. I miscounted here on the slide presented by a quite broad bunch of organizations, as you can see on the logos on the right-hand side. There's one demo that I would uh, like to point your attention to. And we've got not one, but two breakout sessions. The first one uh, around the ecosystem supporting personalized health is chaired by Sergei van Middeldorp and uh, Inga Tarum. And uh, the second one is about the scaling up of the personal health train that I discussed in the previous slides where Wouter Franke and Inga will, uh, will uh, guide the way. Um, so, uh, moving to the very final slide. We're excited where we are today. We are even more excited to imagine where we will be uh, in the future. So I would say to you all, welcome on board and please get involved. Thank you and thank you, Eche. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Gijs, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction and uh, for this a great, uh, let's say, uh, all aboard message. Although the picture was, uh, of course, not COVID proof, but um, uh, hopefully, uh, given the fact that you've won a prize uh, last year, uh, after summer, you'll be able to actually have the bitter ball again with your team to celebrate this prize because uh, it, it deserves a celebration. Congratulations on that. Um, Thank you to all community members for the nice uh, flash talks, the, the pitches. Uh, it's time to start moving towards the keynote lecturer, our keynote lecturer, which is Professor Arno Palotti. Uh, he's from Finland. And, um, well, I have three minutes or less even to introduce him, and with, that's way too short. I mean, this, this man has published over 500 articles and book chapters. So, yeah, it's, it's impossible to do him justice, but I'll try to do it uh, in a, the shortest manner so he can have uh, as much time as possible for his talk. Uh, his the title of his lecture will be about the Finnish genomic research landscape and FinGen, but Professor Anna Polotti is a research director now of the Human Genomics Program at FIM uh, High Life. He's also a faculty member at the Center for Human Genome Research at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and associate member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And, well, and he actually has a long track record in human disease genetics and, well, uh, as I said, it's impossible to, uh, to do him just in a, just a few minutes. Uh, but at this, in this talk, we would like to uh, have his reflections and give, have, a, have a presentation on how he's been working with his Finnish genomic research. Um, and in particular, because he's very well capable, apparently, to make secondary use of health and social data. So to, to, to build a bridge between the primary use and the secondary use, but also between the, the, let's say, the care uh, practice data and, uh, and the research perspective. So he's built many uh, consortia uh, doing this, uh, involving uh, headache, intellectual disability, and, well, it's, it's impressive the amount of work he's done, as I said in the beginning, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk, um, and actually also the questions you have 
to, for Professor Arno Palotti. So the questions are set up. I think the slides are actually also uh, set up. And if uh, Professor Palotti is ready, I would say uh, the floor is yours. One minute ahead of schedule, but hopefully you're ready. I'm ready. Thank you for the overwhelming introduction, which clearly, I mean, <laughs> my mother wouldn't believe it, what you said, and that he, she would be right if she would live. Uh, thank you anyway. anyway. So my, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk uh, to my Dutch colleagues with whom I have uh, done, done decades of, of, of work together with a migrant group in, in Leiden and Hertia van Ommen, um, especially for, for, for decades and decades of, of friendship and, and, um, um, and, and, uh, Communi uh, um, uh, friendship and and co collaboration and and we all miss him a lot as as I uh, imagine you do as well in 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 Netherlands. Anyway, uh, my request and task was to uh, describe the genomic research landscape in in Finland and and yes, I'm uh, I'm I'm probably telling uh, some of the highlights here and but to the end i try to uh, kind of bring you back to the earth and and remember that uh, remind that um, uh, even if we have been in certain aspects su successful so so it's it's not always just dancing dancing on roses but let's uh, do our best um, first of all finland you probably know where that is in the in the northeastern corner of europe and and maybe the point is here that that our surface area is roughly similar to Germany, but we have only 5.4 million people. So that already brings an, uh, us a special situation in, in where most of the uh, people are, are living in the south, uh, in, the, in the capital region, and then there are very large areas uh, which are rather remote, and we still have a very strong kind of Scandinavian or Nordic way of thinking of equality that everyone should be provided the same healthcare services and 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 overall state services, which of course means that that in a in a large surface area with few people, it's all always not not that easy. But that's that's very much in the central of the of the Nordic thinking. So uh, then when we think about, about uh, medical research, genomic research, and especially biobanks research, so what's kind of unique um, in Finland? So obviously, uh, if we think of, of countries that tick, uh, check all these boxes that with a universal healthcare system uh, with... Uh, with an isolated population and, and recalling opportunity and national biobanks and so forth. So especially when you add the isolated population aspect, so uh, the number is rather small. Um, and, and that's where the Finnish situation, even if, 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 if it's a small uh, population, provides some opportunities which are interesting even on a global scale. And obviously, why are we doing it, this? All of, all of us also today, I imagine, that are aiming at, at discovery, uh, improving the speed from discovery to treatment and prevention, which all the time uh, we know that it's, it's long and we would really like to make it uh, speed it up in one way or the other. And then the question is that could genetics potentially help? So once again, the cornerstones where where the Finnish opportunities lie is uh, population isolate. I'm coming back to that one, and then something which is typical for the Nordic countries, which are the national health registers. I'm going to describe them a little bit more in detail, but that is typical for all, all Scandinavian countries, including Finland. Then we also have, uh, partially due to this health register, we have a tradition of epidemiological studies, and they have, through, um, while developing, then provided the, uh, the opportunity to all also store biosamples from these epidemiological studies, and, and they have been uh, the uh, starting point for, for biobanks. And then, of course, genome analysis uh, and genome data, which can be uh, developed in any place. 
So what are we? Uh, what do we mean when we talk about the national registers? In short, it means that that if we take, for instance, the hospital discharge uh, register, that means that every time uh, anyone, if I visit a hospital, whether in in northern Finland or southern Finland, wherever that would be, and stay overnight there, that that diagnosis is then. Uh, brought into a central register that originally was built for administrative purposes. The same is that if, if a procedure is done in the hospital or or I have an outpatient visit in the hospital and or or an outpatient procedure and so forth. So forth. Also now there is uh, a similar register for the primary care that's a newer one and and, and obviously has has its own kind of characteristics. Um, Cause of death, uh, and then each time uh, when uh, anyone purchases um, a, a drug, uh, I mean a prescription drug, that data goes again in a um, central register. And the way you can uh, combine the data is then through the social security number or personal identification number, whichever you like to call it, each of us has, has it, and it's, it's really comprehensively used. You can't even order a, a, a cell phone without uh, this information. And that really builds the basis. And when you look at these nationwide registers, so this is uh, demonstrating how some of them, the oldest ones, the cancer registers and, and, um, and uh, drug uh, reimbursement registers, they go all the way to the 50s and 60s. And, and uh, the hospital uh, as well to the 60s, and, and some of them uh, then, then uh, are a little newer. But anyway, what it results in when every single visit is recorded is that you can have data from, uh, for every healthcare visit over a lifetime. So this is the, the very unique aspect of the Scandinavian system that you can follow up uh, uh, the uh, disease trajectories and predictive uh, measurements over a lifetime and uh, build longitudinal study settings. So uh, the government uh, has a back uh, has been backing uh, this type of idea with the idea that that uh, uh, the healthcare shouldn't just be an expense, but it it could provide also opportunities. And already uh, over three uh, governments, coalition governments. This has been an important part of, 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 of the program uh, uh, to, to identify and think that how this type of data could be utilized more broadly. And that has then resulted in a, uh, in, in a formal program, which is called the Health Sector Growth Strategy, which uh, was built, uh, which has constructed to, and, and run together by three different ministries, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, Ministry of Education and Culture, and Ministry of Employment and Economy. So this is the, the really the, uh, the key operator and background which has built, uh, moved towards uh, real strategic initiatives like the National Genome Strategy, which was um, uh, which was uh, a, a report already uh, a, few, a few years ago. Uh, the Biobank Act that has now been uh, since I think 2013, if I remember correctly. Um, and now the secondary usage of this register data, which is uh, a couple of years old, old uh, legislation as well. There's a bill on National Genome Center, but it's, it's uh, in, in a bill state yet. And it has been uh, resulted up uh, in something uh, where we like uh, where uh, the the vision has been to have a genome center, a cancer center, a comprehensive neuro center, drugs and drug development center, and then uh, the biobanks. Stopping uh, or or uh, describing a little bit more uh, how the Finnish Biobank Act has has um, uh, built the network of, of biobanks in, in Finland. So uh, to get the uh, status of a biobank, uh, which uh, acts under the Biobank Act, 
um, uh, it needs to be officially registered and it has certain requirements. Basically, uh, how it's now run, it's regionally so that every uh, university central hospital has their own biobank, and then there are additionally a few uh, a few on top of that. Um, but but the the new hospital biobanks are primarily run by the university hospital. You can transfer also existing samples there. And what is important that in, in, the, in the consent, there is a possibility to recontact. So everyone who gives their sample to the biobank, it's currently going through the uh, consent procedure, whether an opt-out uh, procedure would be in the in future possible, that we don't know, but currently it's based on the, on, re, on contacting, uh, on uh, the consent. And then, then obviously there's a possibility to collect samples and data from healthcare and, and this covers the entire country and even the uh, act states that collaboration with industry is an okay thing. The uh, uh, five university hospital districts have, have then been initiating uh, to build something uh, which is the, fin, uh, uh, the Finnish Biobank Cooperative, the FinBB, which then coordinates all these uh, biobanks together and helps them help to, to provide a one door or one window uh, for, uh, uh, for scientists and, and people um, from abroad if they would like to work with the biobanks. Then, then uh, how do we then uh, access the digital health data? Uh, that that has been uh, especially now thinking of, of the national register data. There are uh, quite a number of, of uh, how do I say, digitization initiatives. One of the most comprehensive is something which is called Kanta, uh, which is a portal to all healthcare information. And of course, when you think that there's a portal to all healthcare information, the question is whenever is that ready? But there are some areas that are really ready. And that's uh, the aim is that, that there would be a portal starting from healthcare service providers all the way to citizens. And indeed, I can log in and go and look on my personal health uh, data from there, for instance, my vaccinations or, or, or uh, what have you. But it always also should provide an opportunity for, for, for research. But basically, this is to access um, the, uh, the service, uh, healthcare service um, data. And, but then when we think of the secondary use, which is not directly using the health uh, uh, healthcare data for healthcare services, uh, so there is this act of secondary usage. And how that is built is that, um, that now we don't have to apply for, uh, for data from all of these uh, different um, uh, registers, but we can go into one uh, uh, one provider, one uh, uh, stop shop in a way, uh, which is called FinData, that provides and uh, authorizes us to to get uh, this type of, of healthcare data to uh, for our research and. Um, and, and this uh, data needs to be then uh, handled in a secure environment. The idea is that, that they would have their own environment. I think that is still a little bit in construction, uh, but, uh, uh, but basically if you have an own secure environment that fulfills their requirements, you can export uh, individual level data as well. And thin data is, is called the, the place that provides then uh, is the data permit authority that provides uh, opportunity for individual level access data to, uh, to these registers. Then uh, the question is now, now and this is now uh, coupled with also the, the European initiatives on one million uh, genomes and, 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 and many others that how sensitive health and biodata is, is, uh, would be handled in, in Finland. And, uh, one, uh, and the idea is that, that there would be an, a way that, that research data 
uh, as well as, as sensitive uh, individual uh, health data could be accessed and analyzed um, uh, kind of broadly. Uh, as you know, this is not an easy thing to, to do, but this is something that they are seriously building on and, and CSC Center for um, Compu uh, Computation, uh, Center for Scientific Computing is, is an important builder here uh, for uh, building the abilities to, un uh, to handle and analyze this type of data in, uh, in a secure uh, environment. CSC is, is, is here described, Center for Scientific Computing. And this is part of the Federated European Genome Archive. They are active on, on, on the Elixir program as well. And, uh, and the idea is that, that uh, this Finnish system would then be something which uh, would fit in the, into the European framework. But maybe it's good to remember that this is still something which is building and, and constructing, but there is a strong push towards uh, this direction. One of the challenges we, we meet here is that, that um, different um, operations and different data are handled by different ministries. Just as an example here, CSC, the, air, uh, the uh, place that should be taken care of, of, of this type of, uh, of even sensitive data is actually under the Ministry of Education, just as the Academy of Finland, which is the, one of the main funders for, for Finnish uh, research. Uh, the Ministry of Health and Welfare is then the one that actually uh, uh, has the responsibility of the healthcare data. And the Minister of Employment and Economy is then the one that is uh, whose interest it is that this data is also broadly used for research and towards uh, innovation as well. And, and as we know that, that cross-ministry work, uh, although possible, it also has its uh, flavors, uh, but, but it has been important in the in building the national uh, health um, uh, strategy or health uh, uh, well health strategy that that these ministries cooperate without that it wouldn't work then uh, let's go back to uh, to the scientific part in a way that what does the population isolate here mean and what flavor does it have when we are planning these type of of, um, of structures. And uh, first of all, just to remember, we, uh, we had an early settlement thousands of years ago from a relatively small number of, of, of founders, which came from, from south and, and east. And then uh, we were the back country of Sweden for 500 years. And uh, one of the Swedish kings then demanded Finns who had typically lived in the uh, uh, for for uh, for a long time uh, mainly on the coastal regions, they were then uh, this uh, King Gustav was uh, demanded Finns also to move to the eastern and 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 northern parts to protect the eastern border, and that resulted in a second um, strong genetic bottlenecks where small villages were. Uh, uh, established here and there. And then, like typically in, in, in all Nordic countries, there was strong expansion of the population uh, since the 18th century. And that uh, built it up, of, of course, something which typically all geneticists know as, an, uh, as a genetic bottleneck. This has very consequences. One is that on one hand, uh, we have a, an own selection of rare variants that then increased in, in frequency in the population, meaning that, that we, for instance, have our own set of recessive disorders uh, that, uh, uh, that are caused, uh, called the so-called Finnish disease here. But it has another um, aspect as well, which means that when you look at um, 
now it says that my internet connection is stable. I hope I'm back now. Uh, that um, uh, the uh, the overall land, genomic landscape of Finns is more monotonic. That means that that we also identify much more efficiently than in a in more mixed population by having uh, just gene, genome wide genotyping instead of sequencing everyone. And this has obviously provided an opportunity uh, from an economical sense to build large-scale um, uh, genomic resources much cheaper than could be done in a more mixed population. And really, the, the two basic consequences is from, first of all, from medical and genetic research perspective, that it's easier to identify this with genetic variants. That's simply how, how it seems to be. And then, but also from a diagnostic perspective, we have a unique spectrum of of diseases and genetic variants that we need to test. In one hand, that has made things a lot easier because there are fewer mutations, but on the other hand, we have to establish them ourselves. No one does it for us. And an example of these consequences is then the FinGen research project, which aims to collect 500,000 individuals, which is roughly 10% of the population. It combines some of the existing sample collections, a little bit less than 200,000 of them, and collects uh, prospectively some 300,000 new samples. The project was started in 2017. We are a little bit over halfway in, in that one, in the six year project. So, once again, 10% of the population, uh, everyone will be uh, gen was genotyped with. Uh, with uh, array and impute it against the population specific uh, whole, whole genome sequence uh, backbone. Uh, the key phenotype data comes from the national health registers, and that provides the, the research uh, database of 500,000 people and uh, the opportunity for association analysis. This is a public private research project meaning that uh, on one hand, all the Finnish biobanks and all Finnish hos uh, university hospital all universities with a medical school and an institute of health and welfare, which works under the Ministry of, of Health and Welfare, is um, our partners of this project. And furthermore, currently 12 um, uh, pharmaceutical industry partners and Business Finland, which is the Finnish um, innovation um, uh, fund w w that uh, provides um, funding along with the pharma partners with us. This is a true collaboration where the pharma partners or are not just funders, but they are active research members and planning how we do the research and, uh, look, uh, and, and analyzing the data to, uh, together with us. So when you think of the whole innovation chain from the Finnish cities and all the uh, first to the biobanks and, and, and the e-health data, all the way to uh, population implementation for prediction or, or treatment, uh, we all know it's a long way. Um, but FinGen primarily works in this area with basic medical research together for, uh, with the industry to stimulate further clinical reach, uh, research that hopefully uh, results in some uh, aspects to, to preventive uh, measures and new preventive measures and, and uh, new uh, drug uh, targets and analyses. So where are we currently? We have collected uh, four, over 440,000 uh, samples by now of participants uh, currently, which uh, includes almost 300,000 new samples. So we are not far from our collection goal. Really, the collection, uh, the legacy collections are uh, from, from well-known population cohorts or, or, or disease collections. And the prospective collections are mostly from hospitals, university hospitals, and uh, partially from the uh, blood service. This means that compared to uh, UK Biobank, so we are rich on, on disease endpoints. In other words, we have a lot of, of people who already have a disease. And that provides a special kind of flavor again for, for, for the data set. 
our mean uh, median value med median value is uh, close to 65 years which means that they really participants are in the in the age where disease uh, disease have diseases start to emerge and when you look at the uh, mean uh, data so there are 340 health events uh, uh, in in each individual or the mean value it's roughly 340 40 and it, this includes typically 186 drug purchases so a lot of data and uh, especially uh, of special interest are obviously the longitudinal analysis in this book for uh, I'm, I'm not going to dive now into the research research findings uh, that we have I'm, I'm happy to tell them in another uh, um, setting but but uh, I can assure you that there's a lot of interesting data it says again that my internet is unstable I hope that I did I wasn't cut off and uh, but this also means that we have a lot of personal data which means that data protection is a key so so we have built a number of layers uh, to secure uh, the uh, the data uh, environment and the data usage, including things like um, pseudonymization and 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 little bit of, of blurring of the data, so that in, uh, uh, identifying an individual would be uh, more difficult. But how do the partners then access the individual level data? First of all, most of us use the green area, which means that which are results of the core analysis, the core association analysis. It's a, it's a rich um, uh, fever browser that we use to look into the data. Uh, but uh, those of, uh, of us who, who need to uh, access individual level data, that sits in a Google Cloud that we have uh, built, a, a special, as we call, sandbox environment where individual level data sits, but you cannot get it out. You cannot copy it but you can work in that area. You can bring your own tools in there. And, and, uh, but, but the limitation is obviously that you don't have internet access from, from that particular environment. But this is now something that we have built and it, it hasn't been trivial to build it. it. It has costed quite a lot of money and quite a lot of effort to build it, build it up, but, but it's now there and people start to be quite uh, happy with, with that environment. And uh, just to have, have one slide about the, uh, the wealth of new discoveries, the current data freeze consists of 320,000 participants, their genome data and their uh, health healthcare data. And there are more than 4,000 uh, 4, uh, uh, disease endpoints that we use in the basic analysis. More than 400 Finnish specific gene uh, associations has been identified in, in a number of, of uh, well-known and well-studied diseases demonstrating that the population isolate can bring us new biology and new understanding of disease mechanisms. And this is just one example how you can look at just purely medication data. This is the GWAS uh, uh, result of statin, uh, statin, statin uh, purchases. Of course, many of them are, are related to to LDL and, and, and HDL and so forth and, and, and lipid parameters. But any, in any ways, you can start to look at the data from various aspects when you have this type of wealth of registered. And then uh, what could I tell as a scientist from the development of, of, of um, this legislation? I think there have been really fantastic champions in the um, in the civil servants uh, crowd in, in the ministries who have built over uh, uh, from, from government to government, having the persistence to, to uh, bring facilitated, uh, facilitative legislation. It doesn't mean that things have over, over, always been easy. And I think currently the situation seems to be a little bit um, less fluent than um, than it was, and uh, even even though there has been a lot of good things happening, so what is typical then when this uh, even new legislation 
but also all the legislation, when it's implemented, there, there is always one civil servant who sits, uh, to, who has to stamp that yes or no. And when you start to have quite a lot of legislation, you start to have a lot of these single individuals in, in key places. And, and my take home currently has been that over the last couple of years, the, the um, bureaucracy has increased. And I think that's the next thing that we really need to do, that, that, that sometimes thinking from the uh, sitting behind the desk and thinking how things move uh, should be done on a legislative basis. It's not totally easy uh, because most of these people don't have uh, first-hand experience of medical research and some of them don't even have a good grasp what medical research in reality is. So uh, a good discussion with ministries, with those ones with uh, which, um, uh, which have the drafts of, of legislation. It's, it's key that the, the relationship is good and so that we scientists can help them to, uh, to think that how can uh, important aspects as like, like uh, privacy and, and, and data security, how, how can it be balanced? Uh, because there's always a risk, but how, how the risk ha can be kept in balance needs good discussion. And I thank you once again for the opportunity to be able to talk. And I hope this uh, you have a great meeting and, and do great things in Netherlands, as you always have been doing. Professor Palotti, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, one quote comes to mind, a quote by William Gibson. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So thanks for giving us a, a, a gl glimpse of the possible future of uh, healthcare research in the Netherlands. I was not aware that the history of the Finnish settlings would be of interest for this future, but uh, I now understand why it's uh, of interest. So thanks a lot again. Um, we have time. Uh, we're running over time a little bit. I would like to ask you one question, which is a, a sign kind of a synthesis between different questions I had in the chat. Um, can you say something about the trust from citizens in this uh, system, uh, especially since it's centralized and the Netherlands seems more federated as an approach. But is there an opposition, a substantial opposition towards this uh, collection of personal data? And uh, what would your advice be to have this in a public-private partnership uh, role model, to have this trust from the citizens by design? It seems that, uh, that the citizens have good trust. Uh, it, this is a, a unique feature in Finland, that there is a very good uh, uh, trust to uh, to public authorities. Uh, we need to work in a way that we don't disrupt that one. And and I think uh, the one message is that that participation needs to be voluntary, so that people who are really afraid of of of, uh, of, of these things they should be able to opt out in one way or the other. Thanks, thanks again, uh, Professor Palotti, for this uh, great presentation. Um, I hope to see you again. Um, and we're now moving on to the next part of the program, which is uh, about the national showcases. And we introduced them earlier. Uh, these are national projects that connect to the health array uh, communities and the system. So I would like to uh, spend no more time introducing them because uh, we need to uh, have the speakers have as much time as possible. So first of all, I would like to invite Miriam Koopman to give a presentation about uh, the integration of care and research by learning from every patient. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for the invitation to give a presentation here. It's a great pleasure. As a medical oncologist, I'm extremely motivated to integrate care and research by learning from every patient to improve the outcome of the next one. And in the next 10 minutes, I will tell you how we are doing this with our prospective Dutch colorectal cancer cohort study, or shortly, PLCRC. Next slide, please. It's our ambition that PLCRC has a prominent role in the learning healthcare cycle in which real life data contribute to individualized treatment. Real world data will be used for research, which will be combined and enriched with biomedical and interventional research and applied to get the best available evidence for every patient to improve outcome. And this is one of the main reasons 
why we have started PLCRC in the Netherlands some years ago. Next slide. PLC is a cohort study of the DCG in which every patient with a diagnosis of colorectal cancer can be included. We ask if a patient wants to give permission to use their clinical data, which are already there in the electronic patient file and in the Netherlands Cancer Registry for scientific purposes. Next, we ask them for consent for using their tissue, blood samples, and if they are want to fill in patient reported outcomes and to receive an invitation to participate in a new interventional study in the future according to the trials within a cohort or Twix design. With this, PLCRC provides a unique nationwide infrastructure for research. Next slide. Next slide. We started PLCRC in 2014 in one hospital and expanded to the region of Utrecht. Currently, 60 out of the 70 hospitals in the Netherlands are open for inclusion, which is more than 80%. Currently, we included over 10,000 patients. Next slide, our ultimate goal is to include more than 70% of the newly diagnosed patients per year. Next slide. This slide shows that the majority of patients is willing to participate in this cohort study. If we ask patients to use their data for research, over 90% agrees. And you can see how much the percentage is for the other items. A frequently heard argument to participate is that patients want to help future patients, for example, their own children. And this is one of the lessons learned. Patients are willing to participate, so make sure you ask them. Next slide, please. Now we'll continue with four different examples how PLCRC contributes to improvement of outcomes for patients. And please pay attention to the colored balls with stakeholders in the upper left of the next four slides. They show the relevant stakeholders who benefit from the different to be mentioned examples. And I will come back on this in the end of my presentation. First, a wonderful example of what PLCRC can add to a current clinically relevant problem is the effect of COVID-19 on patient welfare. Within PLCRC, we sent questionnaires to 5,000 patients in April 2020 when the pandemic started in the Netherlands. Baseline pre-COVID data from these patients were available in PLCRC and 3,200 patients responded within two months. With this most striking result, next slide, the pandemic has less effects on the mental well being of cancer patients compared to the general population. Next slide. PLCRC can also help in specific subgroups. An NTRAC fusion is present in only 1% of the colorectal cancer patients. How to identify these patients for a new, effective, approved drug? Well, we have our PLCRC cohort with informed consent for tissue and feedback of results. This gives us the opportunity of doing a retrospective analysis, next slide, on tumor tissue of 1,000 patients. The next one, we look for track fusions accordingly. And then next one, the treatment will be offered to track fusion positive patients. And lastly, characteristics are compared to track fusion negative patients. Next slide, again, a wonderful example of how PLCRC will reveal relevant results that will facilitate implementation of drug use. And the next slide, please. Then the third example, which shows how PLCRC incorporates a new innovative interventional trial design according to Twix. First of all, the standard of care. The standard treatment for patients with a stage two colon cancer is resection of the primary tumor without adjuvant chemotherapy. However, still around 10 to 15% of these patients develop a recurrence. Previous studies showed that detectable circulating tumor DNA in blood after surgery is a very good predictor of recurrence. However, it's still unknown if adjuvant chemotherapy can prevent a recurrence in these patients. Next slide. And that's the reason why we started the MEDOC-CREATE study within PLCRC. Patients within PLCRC who give their consent for drawing extra blood samples are included in MEDOC 
And patients who also give their consent to be invited for a new interventional study can be included in CREATE. After the resection, patients with stage 2 colon cancer are being randomized. Half of them will be in the control group, receive the normal standard of care without adjuvant chemotherapy, and the other half will be randomized to the interventional arm in which they will be offered to detect their CT DNA uh, exactly after surgery. If they give their consent to analyze this, they will be offered adjuvant chemotherapy if CT DNA is detected in blood. In the end, patients with CT DNA positiveness who receive adjuvant chemotherapy in the ventral arm will be compared to the patients in the control arm, which will also have CT DNA positiveness, which will be analyzed at a later time point batch-wise. A wonderful example of accelerated implementation of innovation in clinical practice by using a Twix design within PLCRC to test the value of administering adjuvant chemotherapy to circulating tumor DNA positive stage two colon cancer patients. Next slide, please. Then the fourth and last example. Recently, the results of a randomized phase three study were published which showed a survival benefit of encoravenib and cetuximab in patients with a BRAF mutated colorectal cancer. These drugs have been approved by FDA and EMA and four months ago by the Commission Bond for Reimbursement, which means that we are able to prescribe this combination in daily clinical practice from today. However, we all know that patients in clinical trials are mostly younger and fitter compared to patients outside clinical trials. Next slide. So a very relevant question is if there is a comparable effectiveness in daily clinical practice. Well, what can be the solution Within PLCRC, we have the outcome and characteristics of a control group who did not receive this new combination of drugs and will have the data of patients who will receive the new drug. So the solution will hopefully follow in the just started project in collaboration with the of Registers of the Dutch Regulatory Health Institute, in which colorectal cancer will be the first use case. Next slide. With these four examples, I would like to proceed with the factors of success of PLCRC. Involve relevant parties in planning and success for support and sustainability. PLCRC collaborates with the Netherlands Cancer Registry and many other organizations regarding governance, data items, communication, finance, and science. Keep innovating and grab opportunities. Next slide. Next slide. Don't waste time on virtual planning. Think big, start small. Next slide. And all possibilities are covered in one protocol. Next slide. Last but not least, very important, make sure you have a program manager who organizes and coordinates the infrastructure, which we have since six years with Geraldine Fink. Next slide. So what are our next steps and challenges? The PLCRC concept can be used in all kinds of diseases as already applied in esophageal, gastric and pancreatic cancer. More than 90% of patients give consent for participation in PLCRC. The current challenge is to convince healthcare providers to ask all patients. So we really need the integration of informed consent. We also need sustainability in governance and finances, for which central control is urgently warranted. And the next step forward is definitely the registry at the source with automatic data extraction for e to registry for which optimization of EPD design is necessary. Next slide. To summarize, and I hope that I can get this a little bit larger. I'm sorry. I have to... Maybe you can give me my whole, yeah, okay. I don't see my slides anymore. Well, to summarize, provide a learning healthcare system in which real life data of all our patients are being registered, analyzed and used to individualize treatment. This will facilitate scientific research and validation of study results and accelerate implementation of innovation. Current data will serve as the control group for new drugs subgroups in the near future and real-world data should contain the most relevant patient characteristics and outcomes which were also used in trials. Registration at the source is preferred and will minimize registration time by doctors. 
and informed consent of every patient, including tissue with the possibility to do extra analysis, quality of life questionnaires, and consent to share data with pharma and regulatory health. To finalize, and I think you have to go through my slides. To finalize, a unique nationwide infrastructure like PLCRC is teamwork. It's impossible to be complete, but here at a glance, all the different hospitals, including physicians, nurses, patients, and several organizations with whom we participate. Next slide. And then my final and most important slide, which shows the key factor for success. PLCRC offers data, an infrastructure to facilitate research and improve outcome with a clear and important benefit for all potential stakeholders, as you can here see at this slide. For funding agencies, patients, physicians, researchers, hospitals, insurance companies, government and pharma. I thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, well, I'm sorry about the, the, the questions because in view of the time, I think we have to move on, uh, to be honest. I had questions along the way, but you answered them in your presentation. So thanks for that. And I, I hope that you'll be available in the network app afterwards, uh, after this plenary session to ask, answer questions from people that have questions for you. So um, sorry to, to cut you off here, but um, it's hard for me as an online moderator to give non-verbal hints about the time. Um, I would like to move on towards uh, Jochen Miro, uh, who's going to, uh, to present the showcase about the population health data. Jochen, can you uh, take us along? Thank you very much. I'm assuming that you can all see my slides. I can see you, Eche, so if you're nodding well i don't see you anymore so we will see so uh i would like to take the next 10 minutes to uh, to talk to you about a project uh, that we're working on on building a national ecosystem called population health data nl which is powered by uh, health ri as we say in which we are now setting up uh, together with the the umcg that at the Jakob school of public health uh, health kick and very many uh, uh, partners uh, all over the country and I, I think the best way to think about this, if we start by some questions that tend to come up when we think about uh, population health questions. So the first important thing is, so what is population health, right? So we think about the health of groups, uh, which is important when, for instance, designing uh, prevention policy, uh, when thinking uh, about lifestyle interventions on a large scale, uh, when thinking about the evaluation of projects like uh, population health management projects, uh, when we think about the design of new areas. So everywhere where we're dealing with big groups on which the health impact of a certain intervention might be actually relatively small. And what we notice is that many of these questions uh, are being asked all over the country as we transition towards a health system that has prevention and public health uh, much more uh, emphasized than maybe we do now. And what we see is that behind that lie so many questions uh, uh, about the population um, that we actually need a different type of data collection because many of these people are not in care, are not in care yet and not seen there. So we have to rely on data uh, uh, that is collected, for instance, as a consequence of our health insurance or that is, cons uh, that is due to prescription medicine or uh, just cohort data and whatnot. And we have to kind of bring these data together to get the public health element, let's say, of also a health infrastructure, because what we see now is that in many places in the Netherlands, these data are collected separately. And as we move towards data enabled uh, population health, uh, we also see the necessity uh, of having um, more, uh, let's say, collaboration with each other. And this is what brought us uh, last year summer to the concept of developing an ecosystem in which we think these things come together. And this is what I want to share with you now. Now, as Ega pointed out, there's not much time for questions, so I just wanted to point you to the fact that at 20 to 5 later today, so at 4.40, uh, we will have a session uh, in one of the breakout uh, sessions on population health data NL, where together with Rolf van der Heide, we will be taking questions and we can, we can brainstorm further. So if you're interested, by all means, go there. And of course, the other sessions are also all great, so it's also important to go to those. Now, later at the conference, you will be sent 
uh, the the presentation in which there's also a very nice explanation that we had, but now in sake of time, uh, we don't have the time to go through it. So I just want to get you through a, a couple of highlights. So if we think a bit <clears throat> about the background of what's going on, we see that really there's many places in the Netherlands that are working towards this kind of more healthy deal, years ideal. And data is really playing a much more important uh, role in this regard because we really want to have this data-enabled health. But it's quite tricky because we see that there is actually a lot of time spent generating uh, on collecting and linking data, which doesn't necessarily give all the time that's necessary in order to generate insights from data. Yet, if we think about the world around us and we are trying to, you know, influence society. Um, then it's about the insights that we derive from the data and not the linkages that we have. And thinking about that, sometimes we don't have enough uh, time for that. So we see in very many places in the Netherlands that people are collecting data, collecting data, collecting data, and then so much of their budget is put into that that there's not time anymore to develop the insights. There's loads of good initiatives, but oftentimes you, know, you don't know that other parties are working on this because population health is very decentralized, of course, as we know in the Netherlands, uh, and uh, thereby it's also often localized. And in the local context, we sometimes forget that population health is always and everywhere a local concept. So actually all, all the municipalities are dealing with similar problems, so we should kind of work together. And we, we're noticing more and more is that, you know, this kind of data-enabled policy is something that's starting to be concentrated more and more in places that might lead it least so we see that especially kind of uh, more vulnerable communities have less access to the data required for good policy making than the more uh, uh, strong communities so we also have to think about how to get a bit of democratization in there so that was the background and that's why we envisioned um, what we call population health data now where there is a public infrastructure for population health uh, uh, data there is the exchange of knowledge and there's really this this moving forward with an idea basically to have uh, let's say cost effective and sustainable and impactful use of data so in contrast to the previous speaker we don't have all of this set up yet we are building the consortium to realize this uh, partially of course very much jointly with health ri uh, and we see that the the groeifonds that was mentioned earlier uh, by uh, by leona and also by viro is one option, but we also see that there's more and more, uh, let's say, momentum in these topics that we really have to uh, use the population health data that we have in the Netherlands uh, much better to the benefit of the citizens so that we're not just collecting data, but also using data. Um, how we envision it basically is that there's three elements. There's the infrastructure in which these data are collected and, and, and linked. And you, so you can think about, let's say, uh, CBS micro data on income, uh, healthcare use uh, and whatnot. And you link that with data of the environment and you try to understand how environmental stressors affect the health of individuals. Um, then there is a display because I think the important thing that I was also saying earlier is we want insights and we don't want data. And there's many parties in the Netherlands, so-called intermediaries, who from data can generate the most excellent insights. They can visualize them, they can contextualize them, they can test hypotheses on these things. And those are the parties that you really want to empower, that they don't spend their time collecting data, but they spend their time what they're good at, which is creating insights to have a healthier uh, society, which can, of course, be universities, but these can also be commercial parties. And the last part is a learning community, because there's so much going on in these many regions that are not really learning from each other, that there's a lot of double work going on. And that's something that you want to eliminate for more efficiency, so there's more time uh, for insights. Now, the way, of course, you can imagine this is that you know, in future, we have a kind of app store where there's different data sources that you could use. Uh, there's different kinds of tools and analysis uh, uh, that are present. Uh, and then there's different kind of outcomes that you could look at. And you can mix and match these things together so that if you want to, let's say, have a, uh, have a profile of your neighborhood, uh, that you want to do a certain health intervention in us. So let's the think you want to have in your neighborhood, you want to green the neighborhood, and then you want to understand whether or not this has improved the health of the neighborhood. Then you need your neighborhood, you need the twin of the neighborhood. And then by comparing those over time, you can say something about the effectiveness of the intervention that you did. 
because of course in population health there's basically no trials so you're always in observational settings so you need all these uh, data to look around you um then there's this kind of learning community, which I think is really important because we see uh, that there's so many parties working on these uh, data-driven uh, projects that you have to learn from each other. And this is a collection of the parties uh, that, that we've talked to or are talking to in, in the near future. And the important thing here is in developing this platform that we saw with these three elements is that what, what we try to do in the development is we set at the basis uh, concrete use cases that you can use to develop this. So what we see sometimes is data linkages projects that just link all data together, put them in a display, and then think about what could we do with this. And what we're trying to do in developing populational data NL is turning this the other way around. We say, okay, we have this vision in front of us, what are kind of concrete use cases that could be used to develop this? What is the jointness between these use cases at the back so that they can use the same public infrastructure? But what is the insights that need to be generated? And then you can think about the evaluation of population health management in the Netherlands, the so-called CAVO model. You can think about municipal policy uh, to promote health in different communities, which we're doing in the Northern Netherlands. You can think about uh, the uh, development of better information systems for youth and adolescent uh, mental health services, which we're trying to develop also together with the consortium. And based on these concrete use cases, which have a question on improving policy, we derive what is the data infrastructure you need behind that, but always have in mind the societal question uh, that's in front of us, so that in the end we have, a, we have an ecosystem in which societal value is the key element, and the technical infrastructure is basically there in order to develop it. So as I said, at 20 to 5, we have another uh, session on the website. There's some more information. Always get in touch with us uh, if you want. Uh, and I wish you all a very nice rest of the afternoon. And I would like to thank HealthRI for giving us this excellent opportunity to talk in this setting with so many experts around us. Thank you very much. but also uh, staying in touch with the content so to say uh, one question I would ask you later on in the in the networking app or uh, uh, in, in another occasion is on the slides I see a lot of data driven policy uh, mentioned and in your uh, wordings you mention it as data data enabled policies and I think there's a, a nuance difference there and I would like to discuss with you later on so we don't have time for that sorry sorry but there, there, there's, there's a nuance difference between data driven and data enabled and I think I know what you mean by that um, moving on to the next one, last but not least, about the, the uh, building an infrastructure for a nas national radiology, na radiological image repository. And that's uh, Jan Jaap, Jan Jaap Visser from uh, Erasmus Medical Center. Jan Jaap, the floor is yours. Well, uh, uh, um, great to see you uh, again, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction, and thank you, uh, Health Arrive, for the opportunity to share the uh, um, uh, the thoughts we had in the Dutch radiological community on building a uh, an infrastructure for for a national uh, image repository. Um, so my name is Jan Fisser. I'm a radiologist and the chief medical information officer at the Erasmus Medical Center. In, in, in Rotterdam, and let's let's me let's take let let's take the to the background of, of this initiative. So there has been a long term need for a national infrastructure that facilitates imaging research. So a lot of clinicians, of course, are looking how to exchange data, clinical data, but also imaging data. So then the Corona crisis came. And, and it turned out that the crisis uh, urged the need for patient data by research organizations and commercial parties. Um, of course, the researchers would like to do some research on the diagnosis, the treatment, and the, out and the outcome in order to improve, improve uh, patient outcomes, of course. And the commercial parties were also very much involved, and, and they... Uh, they would like to, to develop a product uh, also to improve patient outcomes. And of course, to, to facilitate that, patient data is, is needed, if possible, as much as, as, as is available. Um, it, it also would, uh, was the, 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 the need to compare 
the uh, outcome uh, among hospitals. And of course, if you increase the number of, of cases, you, your research and your product developments will be much stronger. Uh, and one thing to mention is that some people thought a little bit of um, uh, about privacy. Okay, let it go because we are in the privacy uh, crisis situation. Um, so we should be able to share it easily and so on. So then the Dutch Society for Radio Radiology, the, they took the, the responsibility and they decided to establish an imaging repository for COVID-19 patients that allows for the connection with other data sources, such as clinical laboratory and so on. So that's why they um, decided to establish the NCIF, that stands for Netherlands COVID-19 Initiative, and the V in, in English is, is a, an F in, in Dutch, so that's why it's an F uh, in, in the Dutch uh, abbreviation. Um, uh, the, one of the main uh, things were that all Dutch hospitals can participate. It includes uh, conventional uh, radiology, uh, CT scans, and also some basic clinical parameters, and there is a, a governance, and I will come back to that later. So let's talk a little bit more about the ENSIF. What, what does it include? So you can be sure if, if a patient is in the ENSIF, in the imaging repository, the patient consent is according to current legislation. Um, in addition, the patient data is pseudonymized. So of course you um, uh, you have to code something, but you also have, you want to make sure that you can add additional data uh, after you, you, you submitted the first version. So that's why it's not um, anonymized, but soon anonymized. Um, and then, of course, there is a secure connection and secure data storage. Um, there is clearness on the data storage, the access and the uh, commercialization, if, if, if we would allow to do so. And there is a minimal data set on, on clinical parameters that has been agreed upon in a, in a meeting uh, for, for re Dutch radiologists. So let's, what, 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 what clinical data set is in the imaging repository? We decided to bring in some clinical data because to do some analysis, you need also some basic parameters like uh, the age, uh, sex, uh, where does the patient live, uh, is there indeed a positive PCR result? So what's the diagnosis? Was the patient admitted to the hospital or the ICU? Uh, died the patient, yes or no? When was the, um, to, to have a good follow-up, when was the patient uh, uh, imaged? And if it was, would be available, the CORETS and also the CC sever CD severity score. So about the governance of the repository, um, it stands for a local consent procedure. So each individual hospital uh, should have their own consent procedure, ideally captured in the electronic medical record. record. We um, uh, intended for an opt-in, but a lot of hospitals decided, also the Erasmus and T actually for an opt-out uh, procedure because that was much more practical and also more patients could be um, included if we uh, would do it that way. Um, there is a data analysis available for those who submit data. So if you contribute to the data, then you also can use it, of course, according to, to agreements and policy that's being set up by the, 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 the Dutch radiology, the Dutch Society for Radiology. Um, there, will be the, there will be availability of anonymized data for third parties, uh, research, uh, and maybe commercial. I'll come back to that later. Uh, and, and also the questions to be answered are, is it really available for commercial or uh, do we need some funding to get there? And, and to get all there, there is, we are still working on a consortium agreement. So there is a data transfer agreement. So um, there is two hospitals, basically uh, Maastricht and also Rotterdam. They, um, uh, they are able to upload the data to the, uh, the, the imaging uh, infrastructure. Um, but, you know, there is, we are still in, in uh, not a really discussion, but we are still in good discussion, let's put it that way, uh, to come to an, an, an consortium agreement to agree on, you know, what are the conditions that are needed to give 
uh, data to research organizations and also under which um, uh, conditions and would be available in some circumstances for commercial parties. There is connections with, of course, the existing infrastructure. Uh, we use the XNAT uh, uh, storage. Uh, the availability to use the health array infrastructure is very much appreciated. And the clinical data is in Castor or Open Clinica with a preference for Castor. And of course, there is much more involvement uh, with from other hospitals with a leading position for the university medical centers. So to, to do so, to, in order to be able to contribute as a hospital to such an infrastructure, you need a data architecture, you need a data process internally or in your local hospital. And I won't go too much into detail, but I just want to make uh, clear that it is important to, to do it in the right way. So what we do, in, the, in uh, we have the, uh, the so-called ERA core initiative in, in the Netherlands. There also in the, in the Erasmus uh, Medical Center, there is also a poster uh, on, on this uh, uh, conference uh, on this initiative. And how this works is we, we include patient, patient, patients based on the PCR test. If it's positive, they are all included in the, um, in, in the ERA core study. Then, of course, it's checked with the opt-out. If patients say, okay, we are we don't want to be involved in that research. They, they of course, are not involved. Uh, what then happens is uh, there is a, um, a, a, oh, I'm sorry, synonymized ID generated by Castor. Uh, that's also being set in our EMR. Then uh, the exam codes of the radiological examinations are being sent to our imaging trial office. They use a anonymization tool, the CTP server, and then they are able to bring it to XNAT. And also then the clinical data is from the health data platform into Castor, and then the, 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 the parameters you just mentioned are also being set into um, uh, uploaded to the XNAT, uh, local XNAT server, and then we can bring it to a more central environment, the health RI uh, environment. So how does it look like from a more General perspective, the patient, the, the, the data is uh, collected in the local hospitals, then it's uploaded to the university medical centers, it's curated if needed, and then it's brought to the um, 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 trade health RI uh, environment. And I will go into more detail in the next slides, because if you look here, so here the XNAT project is uploaded per center, then it's all coming together into one environment, and then it can be given to specific and dedicated to specific research uh, uh, projects, of course, according to the, uh, the, the data access committee of the, the Dutch Society for Radiology uh, and, and their policy. About the clinical data that's in the ideal situation brought into Castor using the WHO ISEREC, forms specific for, for COVID. Those are very extended, but um, you know, and then the, the best way it's, it's to, if, if they could be filled out, if that's the best way to upload it to the uh, health RI infrastructure that's being brought to a, uh, together in the health RI environment, pulled together uh, with the minimum, minimal clinical data sets, and then it will be available for the specific research uh, projects. Um, this is not to discuss into detail, but just to make sure that it's not, we are not yet there. We have to make steps. There is steps in, in, in automation uh, possible. We can use more open standards. So um, we are not yet there and we are still working on a better infrastructure to, to facilitate this kind of research, uh, not only for COVID, but also for other, uh, other diseases. Uh, and also it's the same for the national um, um, architecture. Um, there is still possibilities to, uh, to, to, to improve it and to, to make it better work so that um, a process can be optimized. So the key success factors for this initiatives is the involvement of relevant stakeholders locally, nationally, and also international um, 
and we can accelerate this whole thing. Uh, Stefan Klein, he's one of my colleagues. He set up the Health Array Imaging Community, and that initiative uh, aims to give uh, the, the research community access to the medical imaging infrastructure that is available at Dutch research institutions, includes software tools, services, and imaging data archive, computing power, training, and networking opportunities, and aims to jointly improve this infrastructure. So hopefully uh, you, a lot of you would be able to join that also to, um, to participate in that community. So to conclude, the Corona crisis accelerated the imaging repository initiative. Agreements and governance is needed and it's still under construction. It's a very complex process, but you know, we are moving forward and automation is, is key for next steps. And I would like to thank you for your attention and give the floor back to the chairman. Thanks again, Jan Jaap, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, as I mentioned before, in view of the time, I'm sorry we, d we do uh, not uh, take any questions at this point, but uh, hopefully you'll be there for the networking occasion or at, uh, at other points uh, people can contact you. So thanks again, Jan Jaap. I hope to see you again in real life soon. Um, for everybody at home watching, uh, this is the time where you go to work. We started this afternoon uh, discussing the why, the how and the what of Health Arai. We had the chiefs talking to you, we had the, the people from the communities talking to you, and we had people from the national showcases talking to you. Uh, and all of them actually reached out their hands for you to join them. Uh, and this is the time to join them uh, virtually via the networking app to start uh, visiting the posters, uh, visiting the demos, visiting the breakout sessions. The first breakout sessions will start at 15.50, so 11 minutes from now, a little less than 11 minutes from now. So, so uh, at this point in time, I would like to thank you for participating uh, for, for this first part, the plenary part. Um, in the networking app, you can schedule also uh, virtual meetings with everybody that you are interested in. Uh, and also to start chatting with people there. So please use that to, uh, to connect and to uh, ask questions that you haven't asked up to this point. This networking app will remain available for the next month, so keep using it and, uh, well, have a lot of fun. Uh, I had a lot of fun uh, because I learned a lot from moving from data to insights. I think there's m a lot of valuable information that can be harnessed from a better use of data. So please explore the possibilities for the coming next uh, one and a half hours, but also afterwards. And when you finish your journey this afternoon, I'll be back for you and uh, see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>